Hi, Chao Chu. Thanks for joining me, friend. Yeah, thank you for inviting me, Tasha. Uh, maybe just to start off, I when I was preparing for this, I was reminded that uh, I really appreciate the offer that you have on your pinned tweet to retweet anything that's like a it's a you say a, a question or a quest for help or offers for help. And uh, I was wondering, and that just feels really generous to me. And I was wondering what sort of motivating that offer that you have for people. Well, uh, I guess the, the simplest thing to say is it just seems like a good way to use retweets. You know, it's like, oh, I have friends who might want to like know something or who might want help with something. And like, that seems like a good thing to signal boost. And I was sort of, I are, I'd like, I think the, what's the word, the like the proximal motivation was I like saw several of those in a row on my timeline. I was like, oh, I might as well retweet those. I, and there's sort of uh, more broadly like, thinking about like how to sort of use Twitter in a good way and mm -hmm. thinking about things like uh like I think there's a way that many people on Twitter are a little careless with retweets and likes like I think they don't more so with likes I think they don't internalize that their likes show up in other people's timelines and so likes behave a lot more like retweets than you might sort of be naively thinking if you weren't keeping that in mind and so I think about like sort of I think a lot about like what sorts of things would be useful to have on other people's timelines. Like what sort of things are like worth putting on other people's timelines. And I figure that like requests for help and things like that, it's like pretty solid compared to like more hot takes or whatever, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you ever had to like decline a request that someone made? Uh, once, and it was because I didn't know them at all. Mm. Um, but also another time someone re requested and I didn't know them at all, but I like, read their timeline and they seemed cool. So I was like, whatever. Uh -huh. Cool. I, I, I've become pretty comfortable with kind of just like winging it uh, when that kind of thing happens and just kind of like accepting it. I, I used to feel much less comfortable. I used to feel very uncomfortable rejecting people for any reason whatsoever. Mm. And now I like, uh, I've sort of been forced into a position of having to reject bunch people because I have my DM requests open and people repeatedly DM request me and I have to reject like 95% of those just for volume. Yeah. I, just, I can't keep up. Um, and because some people creep me out, but like, on it, it's been nice to to relax into being like, okay, I can just re reject a lot of these, and then I can accept some of them, and it's just, it's fine. It's like a fine thing to do. Hmm. Have there ever been like negative consequences of uh, retweeting things that people have asked you to? No, no, not that I can think of. I think it's just been good. I haven't heard much follow. I haven't heard much of like. Like it's, it's not common for people to be like, Hey, thanks for retweeting that thing. I like someone told me a useful thing that usually doesn't happen. It would be nice if that happens. Um, but I assume that's good things that are happening. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for your generosity with that. It's always really inspired me. And, uh, I suspect I'll, I'll be considering taking up a similar policy. So, uh, nice. yeah, I think yeah, it's fun. It's like a fun, nice thing to do. So, um, you know, we had the good fortune of meeting a few years ago, and we've been in touch and been friends since then. And, uh, you know, I have some context for you who you are, and you have a really interesting background, but uh, I imagine some people watching this might not know about your background and would kind of just love to hear from you about your background and life story and how you got to where you oh, are yeah. today in whatever detail you want to share, short, long, sure. whatever. So, yeah, I guess I can, I can try to do like a really short one minute ish version and you can like double click on whatever catches your interest. Cool. Uh, so in very broad strokes, uh, once upon a time, I was like a math competition kid. And then I went to grad school in math. And I was fairly convinced that this was like the thing that I was going to do. And I was like, this is, this was like, it was like the thing that I was very visibly and obviously the best out of all the things that I did. And everyone was like, oh yeah, you're like the math guy. I'm like, yeah, that's right. I'm the math guy. It was like, this is like what I'm going to do. This is like my, my purpose. Um, and I was good at it. I was like very good at, at the very least, I was very good at like learning a lot of math. And then like, also I was very good at explaining it. Like I participated in a lot of online forums where people asked math questions and I would answer those math questions. And that was a lot of fun for me. And I got a lot of attention that way. People were like, well, yeah, you're that guy who answers all those questions. Like I still, that still happens periodically people still are still like I randomly meet people less now but like when there were parties and stuff I would meet people at parties and be like hey I asked I googled a math question once and like you you were the top answer I was like yeah uh, so that was like my past life and um 
Well, that was already pretty long. Okay, then I got involved with the rationalists. So there are these people in the Bay Area and elsewhere called the rationalists. And they're like, hey, we think it's important to think real good about how to live your life and about like what job, how to pick careers and stuff like that. And one of the many reasons we think that is because we're worried that uh, AI is gonna take over the world. It's gonna be really bad. So there are a bunch of people. Some people may have heard a lot about them. I don't know. They like are in the news a little bit more than they used to be, but still not that much. Uh, they're like kind of the reason that Elon Musk started DeepMind, uh, not DeepMind, OpenAI. They're like involved in the story of how OpenAI came to be. So that's like a thread that I think people don't know that much about. Um, anyway, so that that's like a whole long chapter of my life. I like hung out with them extensively. I uh, There's an organization called CIFAR that does rationality workshops. And I volunteered at those workshops extensively for a period of several years. And I like learned a bunch of stuff. I met a bunch of really cool people. I was like, oh man, there's all these people who are like thinking really hard about how to like, use their brains. That's crazy. That sounds great. I like my brain. I like using my brain, you know, like let's let's learn how to use my brain real good. Uh, so a lot of things, that's like a very long chat. I could, I could talk for a long time about just that, just that part. Uh, and uh, eventually I got like very depressed. Basically I was already kind of depressed, but I just kind of got increasingly depressed in grad school. Uh, I like was very lonely and I didn't really know how to make friends and I was coming out of a pretty bad breakup in, yeah, towards the end of college uh, that I didn't know how to deal with and I didn't really know how to talk to anybody about and I didn't know how to like get help with like I didn't know what kind of help I really needed uh, so I was just like really depressed the whole all the time and I was just like trying to not think about this breakup uh, and then I'm not really sure how to tell this next part of the story like uh some of the rationalists got me into like, it's, it's sort of funny that this is how it happened, but some of the rationalists got me into like learning about my feelings. They were like, a couple of them like, oh, we're doing this cool thing where you listen to your feelings. Do you want to try it? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I'll try it. <laughs> and that turned out to be like, just really life-changing. And I found out that I had a lot of feelings that I had been kind of burying inside mm -hmm. of myself for a long time uh, and gradually like learned how to unbury them. And that was, life-changing i was like oh wow i'm like really fucked up <laughs> i'm just like really sad about a bunch of stuff that's crazy um and that just did kept doing that and that kept feeling really good for a long for a while and eventually it was so good that i was like i think the rationalists might be wrong about everything <laughs> i think i don't like the way they do things they like claim they like claim to be like oh no we're not like spock you know we listen to our feelings but like but do you really though mm -hmm. it's like what if you could listen to them even more <laughs> and i just kind of like rebelled against the rationalists um, and I wrote some, I wrote like a document explaining what I didn't like about what the Bay Area rationality community was doing. And I sent that document to a bunch of people and some of them really liked it. And some of them got really mad at me. Uh, and it kind of like, that kind of led to me breaking ties with the rationality community. Um, and then this is like a whole nother long segment of my life story. Then I kind of joined a cult, um, made of people inside the rationality community who were also similarly dissatisfied with the rationality community like we want to like learn about our feelings but also maybe we want to learn about like chaos magic <laughs> and, like, all this other stuff this other stuff that kind of like feels a little too woo to discuss with most other rationalists but we're really interested in it it's really cool um and we were and so i got into that for a while and i like uh, went to burning man for the first time with this group and we had a weird time i had a good time some people had a really bad time um and then that group kind of exploded. There was a scandal. Uh, and I kind of like lost all my friends. That was very unpleasant. And this was actually around the time that I visited Maple for the first time. It was a couple months after this. Uh, I was kind of like lost and confused and looking for any kind of guidance or direction. And uh, Maple, was, Maple was nice. It was nice to visit Maple. I enjoyed it. Uh, you know, it was nice to just like get to meditate and like have a schedule and eat eat healthy food for a while that was really nice. um, but but overall like once this this kind of blow up happened i was just very lost i like didn't really know who my people were i didn't know what i should be doing with my life i didn't know uh, like a lot of the things that i had been doing up until that point like getting really into my feelings and like uh kind of letting the energy of the universe flow through me or something. Uh, I like started to question those things. I was like, are they good? What if they're bad? Uh, 
for lots of, I'm like skipping over a ton of stuff. Um, and so I've been kind of like burnt out and depressed again since then. Uh, probably the main thing that's happened since then is that I joined Twitter on the recommendation of my good friend Malcolm Ocean. He was like, hey, you're like really interested. There's like a group of people on Twitter, they're called the Puss Rats and they talk about cool stuff and maybe it's the same kind of stuff that you would like to talk about. And I was like, oh, cool, that sounds very promising. And so I got on Twitter and I started type, you know, tweeting out a bunch of nonsense and some people liked that nonsense and here we are. Um, now we're um, now we hang out on Twitter and we talk about our talk about our opinions and that's that's all pretty good, uh, and it's it's been good. I've been Twitter has been a nice like um, it's like the most social engagement I get on a regular basis now, and it's just like nice to have that. I still don't really have like an in person community. I, I moved I recently moved uh, away from the Bay Area, and now I live uh, in my mom's house because I don't have to pay rent here, which is nice. And uh, so currently I'm still just like very lost and confused. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's good. I don't know who my people are. That's still true. It was true three years ago and it's true now. Um, but, you know, I'm muddling through. I'm like trying to figure stuff out. I'm like gradually attempting to acquire tools and techniques for working through things. And uh, here we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that story. It, it really is like that. So I appreciate <laughs> you sharing it like that because I don't know when do I, when you talk to someone. Uh, I don't know I think like people's lives are just so beautiful, and it's like you meet someone in media res like in their life, and it's messy and it's complicated. And you don't have all the answers, and <laughs> yeah. it'd be nice if it was a happy ending story. It was like oh, it all worked out, and like I was perfect and happy ever after. But uh, it's it's confusing and messy and. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, yeah. you being vulnerable with that story. Yeah, thank you. Um, There's a bunch of other stuff too. There's like a whole, I left out like two more breakups. Uh -huh. Three more breakups really. They uh -huh. were also very impactful, but. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff I'd love to sort of double click as you said yeah. into um, maybe um, just to start, um, especially because I sense this might come back in interesting ways. You know, I, I'm the, uh, I and I imagine many listeners will be, uh, you know, sort of innocent about math. And I wonder if you could just describe like what kinds of math you were doing and um, <laughs> what what interested you in it, about it, and also uh, sort of how you hold mathematics now. Uh, which is three separate questions. I can yeah, take you yeah. through those if need be, but I can kind of like wind my way through them. I think I want to. The first one's kind of annoyingly hard to answer. Like I think mm. the so I'll start with the second one. Uh, I think the most honest answer I can give, or like one as like honest but tending towards cynical answer, is that I was good at it. Like mm. I, I was aware from a pretty young age that I was like somewhat better at math than the people around me, and that was like really cool. I was like, oh, that's the thing that I'm good at. Mm. Uh, so I kept doing it, you know. Like I kept being placed in like advanced math courses and stuff. And basically I just kept getting a lot of social validation for doing it. And I was like, oh, social validation. I like that. That's good. So, <laughs> there, yeah. so, you know, like a lot of it was shaped by the people around me also. Like there was a, a big part of it was that I had a, uh, I had a calculus teacher in high school who kind of like recruited me. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm honestly not really sure how to explain this. She like, she kind of like decided that I was a like person worth shaping or something. And kind of like took me under her wing and was like we're gonna like get you all the good stuff we're gonna like train you you're gonna join math club and you're gonna practice for competitions and you're gonna do competitions and you're gonna do well in those competitions and then we're gonna send you to like summer programs and you're gonna do all those summer programs and like all of this is going to build like a really great college application for you which all of that happened i mean she didn't really say that in so many words but that's that was sort of her plan and that's what happened like she she had me do a bunch of competitions and I did well in those competitions and that built like a really nice college application and I got into MIT and it was like basically because of her. Um, so that was like a huge part of it. But also in the meantime, I was like doing math on the site on my own. I, uh, there was this forum or problemsolving.com where people talk about like contest math and I had a lot of fun on that forum uh, just being like, oh yeah, people have questions and I can answer those questions and then I can like you know, see how other people answer questions and I can like pick up techniques from them. And I like, this is actually when I started blogging uh, about math in 2006 when I was 16. Uh, 
like they had a blogging platform and I like blogged about math on that platform. I was like, oh yeah, here's this problem. Here's like this cool way that I solved this problem. So it, it was just like a big thing that I was into for a long time. And I got like a lot of validation and a lot of support for being into it. And so I just like kept being into it for a while. Um, that's sort of the more cynical answer. It's just that I was good at it and this was the social feedback, but you could also try to like, uh, I could also try to be like, what was actually compelling about it as an activity in and of itself. Um, and I could sort of say some political poetic things about that too. There's a like, uh, there's something I think quite, I hesitate to say beautiful, but there, I don't really have a better word than beautiful about having sort of direct access to truth with a capital T. Like when you, when you get good enough in math that you can just like figure stuff out on your own, you can, you learn, you learn that truth exists, first of all, you learn the truth exists. Like it definitely exists. There's definitely some truth somewhere. And at the very least, it's in math, if nowhere else. There's, you can definitely figure things out that are de definitely true. They're true because you just keep testing them forever and ever. They just keep being true. Other people on the other side of the planet could just keep testing the same thing forever and ever, and it'll still be true. That's like kind of great. There's this kind of universality. It's like anywhere you go, math will still be true. That's like great. There's almost nothing else you can say about mm -hmm. this, like maybe physics. Uh, but that's like kind of awesome. That's like a kind of, kind of a relief. It's like, okay, at least this stuff is true. That's like pretty good. I don't know what the hell else is going on. Um, like there's this quote by John von Neumann, one of the sort of the greatest mathematicians and physicists in history. Uh, and it goes something like, if people think, if people don't believe that math is simple, it's only because they don't understand how complicated life is. And I like, I was really struck by that quote as a kid. And it was like one of the quotes that I, that I had as, as like the tagline on my math blog, because it's like, yeah, life is very complicated. I don't understand life at all. But math, I like, I can kind of get, I can kind of get math sometimes. And that's like pretty, that's like a kind of relief. Mm. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's, this, there's sort of at least two bits that is not only this truth exists, but also like, I personally can figure it by myself. That's like amazing. Like I personally have the capacity to acquire truth. Like, and I think this is this is an experience that a lot of people don't get. And it, like, I don't know there's good and bad things about it, but I think there's something there's a kind of like epistemic courage that I feel like it gives you if you can get an experience like that. If you're like, not only does truth exist, but I personally am capable of discovering it. Uh, there's like a kind of there's like a kind of independence that you can acquire once you like believe that about yourself that you personally are capable of discovering truth, hmm. as opposed to like. I think the way that a lot of people kind of implicitly function is that like they, they, a lot of people I think don't believe that they're capable of discovering truth. Not, not just like, you know, I'm not talking like scientific discoveries, just like simple truths, just like, should I take the COVID vaccine or not? You know, things like that. Like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't believe that they're capable of discovering those kinds of things and that they have to like rely on other people to do it. And that's not necessarily bad, but it is a vulnerable to the people around you being stupid. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there is a kind of vulnerability in it. You have to rely on, on, truth finding apparatuses out there in the world and maybe they're not very good or maybe you don't have very good judgment about which ones are good hmm. and that's a little scary so it's nice to be like okay but i can you know given enough time and dedication like i personally could figure some stuff out if i wanted hmm. to that's like it's pretty nice to have that that was my like question two yes yes and um you know what kinds of math were you interested in i mean and i, I guess i'm also curious now that i think of it like how you would categorize them just because basically the, the, the main categorization that I know about is like applied versus uh, pure mathematics. And yeah. I imagine that it gets more nuanced than that. So, yeah. So this is a, this is a tricky question for me to answer because mm -hmm. the stuff I was working on was very pure and very theoretical and very abstract. Uh, it's like stuff that other pure mathematicians will make fun of you mm -hmm. for being into um, okay. <laughs> because it's, even more pure and abstract than the other parts of pure math. Mm. Um, like a lot of the stuff I was interested in is uh, it centers around something called category theory, which I will not be able to explain to you. Um, but I can get, I can I can try to describe the the position it occupies relative to other subjects. So like a lot of category theory involves noticing patterns in other branches of mathematics and trying to abstract those patterns. Like there are, it turns out, so there are these things called categories. I'm not gonna explain what they are, but it turns out that a lot of the kinds of objects that other branches of mathematics study can be organized into categories. And then you can sort of prove general things about how categories work. 
And then hopefully you can apply this very general sort of meta mathematical knowledge to other branches of mathematics. Be like, oh, well, in this branch of mathematics, we have some category theory that implies that you can do these things. And in this other branch, that same batch of category theory implies that you can do these things. This is very abstract. I'm very sorry. Like, oh, it's good. It's good. You're doing great. Like, yeah. Um, the, the stuff that's like easier to talk about uh, is I was also very interested in topology, which is like the study. Of, it, it's sort of kind of lame to say like the study of shapes, but that's kind of like, you know, uh, I could try to give a, sli give a slightly more detailed description. So like, for example, let's take the, the surface of the, the earth. So the earth is like roughly a sphere. Um, and so like the, the surface of the, of the, of a sphere is an example of something called a surface. It's called a surface. Uh, it's called a two-dimensional manifold. And that's like an example of the kind of thing we study in topology. We study like what makes what makes the surface of a sphere different from, for example, a flat plane. Like, you know, once upon a time we thought the earth was a flat plane. And the flat plane has different properties than the surface of a sphere. One of those properties is that if you start, if you go, if you keep walking on a flat plane and just keep going, you'll never end up back where you started. You'll just keep going off into infinity forever. But on a surface, on a, on a sphere, if you keep going, one, if you keep start walking one direction, keep going, you'll eventually loop around back to where you start. That's like an important difference between a, a sphere and a flat plane. But there are many other differences, but that's like a pretty basic one. And so topology investigates things like this. Like what makes a sphere different from a donut, different from a flat plane, different from a cylinder? Um, and so I was very interested in this sort of thing. There are some very cool applications. Uh, there's a thing that I was very interested in called topological quantum field theory, which I also cannot really explain. But at the most basic level, it involves using these kinds of topological shapes uh, to reason about quantum field theory. Uh, it turns out that there's like cool things you can do with that. Like you can visualize, for example, a particle splitting into two particles as like a kind of tube that splits into two tubes. There's all sorts of of, of, of weird things like that that it turns out that you can do and it turns out to be useful to do that sort of thing. Um, so I thought that was very cool. I was like, oh man, finally an application. I've been doing all this pure stuff, but here's like, could be an application. It's like, what if we could like understand physics? So, so here's, here's the thing about quantum field theory. Um, like physicists know how to do it. They know how to do it and they know how to use it to like predict lots of nice things about particles and stuff, but it sort of doesn't have a rigorous mathematical foundation and it hasn't for decades. Like there's a, there's a lot of stuff that physicists do in quantum field theory. The mathematicians are like, you're not allowed to do that. <laughs> there is mm. no, we have no framework that lets you do that. And they're like, tough titties are doing it anyway. <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's this very interesting challenge from, as a pure mathematician to be like, what's going, like, what is the mathematical foundation of quantum field theory? Because we don't really, I, I don't know how accurate that statement is. That might be less true now, but at least when I was looking into the So it's, it's like, it really works, know. but they don't know why from a mathematical perspective. Yeah, it works, uh -huh. but it involves doing these kinds of things that mathematicians are like, that's illegal, you can't do that. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> like doing these integrals over spaces that are like too large to integrate over. It's like, you can't, that integral doesn't make any sense. And they're like, tough titties are doing it anyway. But uh -huh. if it did make sense though, here's what the answer would be. And they're like, that's stupid. <laughs> uh -huh. it's, this, it's, it's very interesting. It's also very difficult, like very, very smart people have worked on this for a very long time and we still don't really have an answer. So, mm. but I, I was like arrogant enough to believe that like, oh, maybe there's like something that I can say about this problem. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be like pretty exciting. Although despite feeling that way, I never really bothered to like settle down and actually learn quantum field theory. Like I, I acquired a bunch of textbooks electronically, but I never actually read them. Mm. Uh, I was often in the habit of like, hoarding books in this way I was like oh yeah maybe I'll read that book someday and then I'll never read that book ever it is like uh, that yeah yeah I mean it's hard when I was again very depressed in grad school and so eventually it became like very hard to be motivated to do anything so I was just like well it's mm. like oh you know so mm. that was difficult but I, there was a period when I was very excited about this stuff I was like oh yeah we're gonna fucking learn how physics actually works that's that's great that's fucking mm. awesome. and how do you hold mathematics now it's tricky. I mean, I think now I look back on not only what I was doing, but on sort of what all of the other grad students around me were doing. I was like, this is something has something feels very unhealthy to me about this whole atmosphere and this whole this whole community and this whole like like pure mathematics used to like not be separate from applied mathematics. Like I, I briefly studied abroad at Cambridge and it was very interesting looking in their math curriculum and seeing like 
classical mechanics as a math class, not a physics class. It was a math class. And I was like, oh, that's right. This place is very old. Isaac Newton was here. <laughs> like mm -hmm. Isaac Newton worked here at a time when people did not really distinguish between pure and applied math. And in fact, didn't really distinguish between math and physics. It was all just like stuff that they were, you know, formulas and equations and they mm. just figured stuff out about the world like there's a I know, I, I, I've always struggled to communicate this but I, I've, I've like attempted to tweet about this for a while there's this like like Euler also one of the greatest mathematicians of all time like wrote a paper about how to position um, masts on ships for sort of maximum efficiency or something like people mathematicians used to be interested in the world mm. like they used to consider their job to be to like find out stuff about the world mm. and like something very bizarre happened sometime in the last century where there was this like very large schism somehow between pure and applied math and like pure math kind of like went off on its own and like spun off into these sort of glorious realms of abstraction and in in doing so decided that it was like too good for applications so it was like we're just going to keep doing our thing now we don't need to really worry about applications someone else is going to find applications for us later meanwhile we're just going to like spin off into our into our realms of theory and there's something that feels very ungrounded in mm -hmm. right now. There's a way that like a lot of pure math strikes me. Like the feeling I get when I do a lot of it feels almost identical to the feeling I get when I play a puzzle video game like Portal or something. Like it's mm -hmm. just a big puzzle. It's like a really hard, really complicated puzzle that you have to like have a lot of training to understand. And so you can feel really good about yourself when you solve the puzzle. You're like, oh, yeah, I solved this really hard puzzle. But it's like, it's not that different from speed running. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It's like very similar as an activity, except that it's maybe a little bit more high status. Mm -hmm. um, but it didn't feel like connected to the world anymore. Even when I was working on stuff that was nominally like, oh, this is sort of has something to do with physics. It mostly didn't. It was mostly just like these puzzles for puzzles sake and like, people will devote entire careers to like solving these very, you know, these very, very specific abstract puzzles in these like very isolated field, not very isolated, but like these, these are kind of isolated fields of study. And you just look at that and you're like, what's the point? <laughs> like, why did you do this? Like, why did you do this other than like, this is what you know how to do. And like, you need to keep your job or whatever. It's just like, it all seems like I had I had a kind of like quarter life crisis mm -hmm. uh, in grad school as I was thinking about this. I was just like, why why am I doing this? Like, like the, the specific subject I was working on was like so abstract that I was pretty sure there were less than four people on the entire planet who would be prepared to understand the thing I was trying to do if I did it. I didn't do it. I I made very little progress on that project. But even if I had done it, like just so. It, the audience, the possible, the, the potential audience for that paper was so tiny. It was like my advisor, one guy at Harvard, maybe another guy at Harvard. <laughs> like, mm. And like, no one else was really going to, going to be prepared to understand it. And it just seemed really pointless to me. I was like, why, 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 why are we, why are we doing this? Like, there's something that feels, I mean, it's, this is not, this Part of this is not exactly new. People have this concept of like publish and perish in academia and have had for a while. But I really think there's something like really fucky that happens when you like get a bunch of, like where you force academics to publish things in order to keep their jobs. Like obviously the quality is gonna drop dramatically because people are going to publish things for the sake of publishing things and not because they actually have anything to say. Mm -hmm. Like some, I think, and I think similarly something kind of funky happens to art when you decide to, then you have to like make art in order to keep your job, mm -hmm. which again, then you start making art in order to pay the bills and not because you have anything to say. And, and that just doesn't, I, I, I am increasingly skeptical of, of that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. like my sort of spicy hot take about pure math. And part of the issue is that very few people are in a position to make this criticism because most of them don't have enough context to understand what kinds of things pure mathematicians do? Like the vast majority of people will just be like, "Oh, they're doing something I can't have, I can't hope to understand." I guess it's good. People think it's good. I guess it's good. And I'm like, "Nope, I've been there. I'm here to tell you, it's not good. It sucks. It's really bad." Hmm. There are people who are going to listen to me say that. Other mathematicians are going to listen to me say this, and they're going to get defensive. This has already happened. They're going to get defensive, and they're going to be like, "Well, you're just this is just sour grapes or whatever. It's just because you couldn't hack it." It's like, no, it's not like that. I promise you, it's not like that. It's just actually. Not like it's really bad. I think it's really bad. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. And so I personally like have not found that my math background is very relevant to any of the things I want to do now. Like I want to 
work with people, you know, I want to like help people with their problems. And math is just not almost not ever relevant to that, except mm-hmm. some people have math trauma. And I've actually been working with <laughs> people about that. And that's been cool because it's like, oh, I could finally actually put my background to some because some other people are like, yeah, I would I would love to be able to like read an equation without you know breaking out into eyes <laughs> or whatever. That's not an example, but it's it's like the kind of thing like, oh I have all these feelings about math for reasons and it'd be cool if I could work through them with someone who knew math. Like, yeah, I, I can do that. So that's like that part's kind of cool. It's kind of cool that I can do that. Mm-hmm. It's sort of a unique intersection of like two of my two of my of my um specialties. Yes. Uh, that's that's really about it though. Like I briefly got interested in crypto a while ago and it was kind of nice to like learn how the blockchain works and stuff like that. But even I don't really even apply any of that. That's not really even an application. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can imagine that that's uh, part of what drew you to the rationality community originally was sort of a different perspective on things, but I, I would love to hear from you just, yeah, like what drew you to the rationality community and, and those materials and things like that. Yeah, so it started when I was a senior in college. Things were going very well. It was like one of, it was a very successful year. I had just gotten into grad school. I was dating a very lovely girl. And I was like, generally, I felt like I was on top of the wall. I got an NSF fellowship. Uh, and I was like, wow, I'm really kicking ass at life right now. This is like pretty great. Nice. Um, and in the midst of that, a uh, couple of things happened. I'm trying to remember. I don't remember exactly the order that these things happened. But I found, so I was on TV Tropes one day. Uh, and I was looking at the TV Tropes has fanfic recommendation pages. And I was looking at the fanfic recommendation page for Harry Potter. And I found Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality which is a fanfic that's written as like a rationality recruitment tool by Eliezer Yukowski. And I read it and I was hooked. I was like, wow, this is such a fucking good piece of fanfic. Holy shit, what the fuck? This is amazing. There are like so many interesting ideas and you know, just ridiculous things that happen. It's just like really funny. And I was like, this is great. Like who wrote this? And then, you know, I clicked and it was like less wrong or whatever. Oh, what's that? And then I clicked on that and that took me to the, le- to the lesswrong.com, which is the website where the rationalists hang out on the internet and talk about rationality stuff. And Eliezer Yukowski, written this whole long series of posts there called the sequences because i was like, oh, you should read the sequences oh what's that so i read that that was like very very mind-blowing uh there's like a lot of stuff in there that you know as as a as a, a young impressionable 21 year old with a penchant for mathematics was like very appealing to me he just he laid out this whole picture first of all he laid out this whole picture of like uh this like cognitive biases stuff, you know, like I went on Wikipedia and I read a list of cognitive biases and I was like kind of horrified, honestly. I, I was, I had at that point been very used to relying on my mind functioning perfectly. You know, I was like very reliant on this thing. This was like the sort of, this was like everything good in my life happened because of my brain, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was very, very, very reliant and dependent on it. And to, to even to just have someone else suggest to me, like there are ways in which you're mind can be systematically wrong about stuff and i was like that's fucked up <laughs> that's not okay i need to fix that <laughs> like, yeah that's really that's a big deal that's like really important so that, that was kind of the hook it was like elios yukowski told me about cognitive biases and i was like this is fucked up man what do i do about this and he's like well here's sort of the rest of my writing about what you do about that uh you like learn about Bayesian probability and you like get good at countering confirmation bias and things like that and I was like wow this is like a really compelling program for how to like make be better at thinking and also there are a lot of interesting things to think about you know he also was like by the way artificial intelligence is really bad and also when I try to talk to other people about it their responses are insane like people are insane they give objections to things that are not their real objections they're just like random some kind of random crap that they thought up so they can shut me up and it sucks. And I'm like, wow, that that's that does suck. That's terrible. Like, like it was as a person who was very frequently like in some sense smarter than the people around me and could like, I was very used to the idea that I could know things that the people around me didn't know. Uh, and so, you know, Eliezer's pitch was like, did you know that most people are just fucking crazy and you just can't explain anything to them. They're just like, they just are, certain ideas will just cause them to shut down and they just like won't listen to you. I'm like, that's fucked up and I believe you. <laughs> like, <laughs> extremely believable to me that that's the way the world works. You know, it was a very compelling worldview for me at the time. And in some ways it still is. Um, that, was, that, that was like the initial hook was like, wow, there's Eliezer Yukowski. His writing is just very good. Like the stuff he writes in the sequences, like there's a lot of fire in there, you know, like he, 
some, there's some compelling stuff there. He was really like, it's really like channeling something when he wrote that. Hmm. And I was just very, I was very compelled. It was, it was very compelling for a certain kind of like hyper analytical nerd, which I was. And it like, it just really, it really sunk its teeth into me. Mm -hmm. uh, hmm. And that, that was sort of like the first bit. And then, you know, the time came for me to choose which grad school to go to. And I, I, I already independently really liked UC Berkeley um, because there are a bunch of people there working on stuff I was interested in. And also UC Berkeley happens to be very, very, to be very, very close to where the rationalists were. The Bay Area rationality community was like based very close to UC Berkeley. And so there's this kind of bonus. It was like, oh, if I go to UC Berkeley, I'll get to hang out with the rationalists. That's like mm -hmm. a cool bonus. Uh, so I did that. And um, then I made contact with some of the rationalists. They, they actually, they actually uh, ran an event at UC Berkeley. It was like an introduction <laughs> to the rationality community for anyone who was interested. Uh, and I met Anna Salman, who was the director of CIFAR for all, at the time and for quite a while afterwards. Um, the organization that runs the rationality workshops and we chatted a little bit and she was like oh yeah you seem cool we should stay in touch and i was like cool and then she invited me to um a workshop the rationality workshops and i went to that workshop and it was very that workshop was was very life-changing like it was just some of the most interesting stuff i'd ever seen in my life like there are all these people who are like the just the kinds of questions they were thinking about were so revolutionary to me at the time just like how do we like make better use of our minds to like think about important stuff like even just the basic idea is like what if you used your brain to think about your life mm. instead of about math i was like Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like that was that was legitimately a new idea i had yeah. not really i i had sort of conceived of myself as a person who used my brain to think about math i was like yeah that's what this is for this is for math that's what this is for and then the rationalists were like what if it was for other stuff and i was like oh it could be for other stuff <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. like that that alone was already was already a big upgrade and then you know a lot of specific ideas people were like oh here are these here are these like rationality techniques you can like try out these exercises on paper and maybe they'll like help you figure out how to live your life better it's like whoa living my life better that sounds great uh, so that was that was kind of the the second half of the hook, and at that point I was I was hooked. I like I was really I really liked these people. I like really wanted to stay involved. I was physically nearby, so I could like hang out and I could volunteer at workshops, which I did a lot. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun. There, were, like every time I got to meet a bunch of really interesting people, and I got to talk to them about a bunch, a bunch of really interesting things. You know, the conversations I was having at these workshops were like by far the most interesting conversations I've ever had in my entire life. Mm. Uh, People, there were just so many, like, you know, I, this is where I learned about like paleo and keto. This is the first time a person told me I should work out. <laughs> like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. There's like, yeah, working out is like a cool rational thing to do. I was like, whoa, really? That's amazing. Really? What? Yeah, just... <laughs> like, oh, I guess yeah, I could try that. It's like really, yeah, it's like, it's really good for you. It's, in fact, it's good for your cognition. It's like, whoa. <laughs> <That's great. Yeah. laughs> like wow. just all this stuff you know like like a lot of like i guess you could say like kind of silicon valley tech memes now mm. but they were very new ideas to me at the time I, like, yeah these are the first people i knew who were saying things like that it was just the whole thing was just like very mind expanding in a bunch of ways and it was, it was really good it was really good for a long time before i kind of i don't know i guess you like the, it sort of it feels sort of uh arrogant to say this way but i like, kind of outgrew some of it um sure. but at the time i definitely had not outgrown it. at the time there was like a bunch of really new stuff and I like really soaked it up and it was really cool. It was really mm. exciting for a long time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's such a theme in life. I don't know that like something is really good for you for a while and then, and then it changes and you outgrow yeah. it and move yeah, on yeah. to the next thing. So, yeah. Well, uh, you, you talked about this earlier, but, um, you know, you said you talked a lot about like feeling your feelings and you thought that that was something that the rationalists didn't do very well, even if they sort of gave, uh, you know, nominal lip service to that uh yeah what 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 sort of made that transition happen for you, happen for you such that you did outgrow the rationality community and the methods they're using and so on yes so that's a long story i can try mm -hmm. to let me see how so i can again try to like give a give a short digest that you can double click on stuff so the first bit was uh at some point i was invited to an alumni workshop they're like oh we're going to take a bunch of and i was like we're going to take some people who went to our, our normal rationality workshop and we're going to give them like advanced content that's sort of more experimental on our, on our i was like oh yeah that sounds great 
And uh, <clears throat> one of the things we did at that workshop was something called genlin focusing, uh, which would go on to be like a found, the very foundational practice for me. Um, and genlin focusing is like a, it, it's, it's, it's not quite accurate to, to describe it this way, but very, very roughly, it's like, what if you described how you were feeling? <laughs> Uh, it's more complicated than that, but that's very roughly how it is. And I, that was just like not a thing I had tried to do. And so they're like, why don't we try to do it? And I was like, okay, sure, let's try to do it. Um, and you're supposed, to, you're supposed to check how that, how the things you're saying resonate with feelings in your body, um, roughly with feelings, with like felt senses. And so I tried that. And when I tried that, I became aware that there was this like lump in my chest, this like, I didn't really know how to describe it. There was like a sticky, dark, lump of some kind in my chest and kind of in my throat too i think but definitely in my chest and i tried to give words to it um and i i, I was like it's kind of like gaspy like like i was having trouble breathing as i focused on it and uh and i finally got the word lonely that was like the best i could do i was like because i'm lonely and it, you know in retrospect i was in fact very lonely but this was the first time i had been like made consciously aware of that fact in some sense mm. i was like oh i guess i'm lonely and this was terrifying like i mm. ran away immediately from this this whole thing was just too scary to do so i just i didn't do it for a while afterwards but that was sort of like the first touch uh, the second touch was i took acid for the second time uh, this was unrelated to the rationality community this was just with some friends of mine from college uh, and it felt like i Like a lot of things happened, but one of the most striking things that happened was that like there was this way that I had kind of like gotten really numb to almost everything. Everything that happened to me, I kind of like did it really like impact me. It was like, oh yeah, that's just another thing that happens to me, whatever, that's fine. Uh, and the acid undid a lot of that numbness. And if everything felt very new, again, like a thing, like like I watched a lot of TV that night and like a thing would happen, you know, in the TV show or whatever that was like completely banal in some sense nothing i hadn't seen a million times before like a character harms another character and they're sad about it i'm like yeah that's i've seen that before but but during that trip it was as if i had never seen it before like it hit hit me as in as it was I like, oh that character hurt that other character and now they're upset about it oh my god like this is it was it just like hit me anew somehow it's like wow i was just like not used to this anymore like it's now things are capable of actually impacting me and i felt like it felt as if I had been dead, really. Mm. Like it felt as if, I had, as if I had been dead for a long time, and then the acid like brought me back to life again temporarily. I was like, "This is fuck. This is crazy. What the fuck is this? This is like really fucked up right here." Um, so that was that was like a really that really stuck with me afterwards. I was like, "That was really that was something that was really important. Like whatever happened during that trip was extremely important, and I really mm. should figure out what the fuck that was." Mm. Um, but also, I didn't really follow up on that. Uh, for a while afterwards like it just kind of happened and then my life was bad again for a long time after but I did plant a seed uh, and then the third seed was later some of the rationalists this was around uh, 2017 it's like beginning of 2017 um, a bunch of okay so another thing that happened during that time was that I went through a breakup and we could talk about that but just we'll just say I went through a breakup and it was really bad and I was very upset about it all over again uh, and it was like oh this is terrible I should like I, I have to fix something, like something has to change. I have to like learn something about how to deal with my feelings or something. Uh, and then I was introduced to this practice called circling, uh, which you guys also did at the monastery, at Oping Maple, uh, which again, the very reductive description of it is, what if you sat in a circle and talked about your feelings together? Mm. <laughs> um, very reductive. It's, I, I, it's very difficult to explain circling. I'm not gonna try, unless, unless you want it to look like on it. And then maybe I'll try. Um, but that was another, that was like a whole nother revelation for me. I was like, oh, not only could I talk about my feelings to myself, but I could talk about them to other people. And they could tell me their feelings in return. And there could be this whole like give and take of like seeing and being seen. Like that was very, that was extremely new for me. I like cried a bunch. Um, when people really did it, when people were like really doing it, I was like, holy crap, this was, this is like nourishing something in me I like hadn't known wasn't being nourished. It was like a whole part of my, it was like a whole atrophied part of my being that had just been like starved for a very long mm. time. And this was like mm. set up, finally feeding. Like, yeah. It's fucking crazy. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that seemed like the most important thing I could be doing for quite a while. I spent 2017 pretty much just circling any opportunity I could find. I like, 
I, I was still volunteering at rationality workshops at this time. And I started running circles at those workshops. And I can't, I just, it's amazing that they let me do that. <laughs> like uh -huh. like uh -huh. I did that with permission. I asked them, can I run impromptu circles? I have no training. <laughs> I've uh -huh. done it three times. <laughs> They're uh -huh. like, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> uh -huh. They wouldn't do that now. <laughs> but yeah. at the time it was kind of, it was a more of like a wild west kind of atmosphere at the time. Things were a little bit less, uh, less, um, regulated which i appreciate like i really learned a lot from trying to run them myself because i had to like make sure that i had to like you know teach a bunch of other people who didn't know anything about circling and i barely knew anything i had to like teach a bunch of people how to do this thing that i didn't even know how to do and sometimes it went really well and sometimes it went really poorly uh, but it was very educational for me I learned a lot about myself and a lot about other people one of this this is uh, I struggle to talk about this on Twitter now, but like this is where I learned a bunch of things that sort of inform a lot of how I tweet. Um, in particular, like I, I really, this is really when I learned that like other people, not just me, have a lot of stuff going on under the surface that they don't talk about most of the time. And a lot of that stuff involves like agonizing amounts of emotional pain. <laughs> like this is where I was like, oh, it's not just, oh, everyone else is really fucked up too. They just don't talk about it ever. And that's why I don't know. Uh, but I, I learned because in circling, they talked about it. And I watched people like break down in tears. And I watched people like admit, you know, like tell things, tell, like tell things to the group that they'd never told anybody in their entire lives. And I just like watched mm -hmm. this kind of thing happen over and over. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, all that stuff has been there this whole time. And I just didn't know about it. That's fucking crazy. <laughs> like I, I like saw my own heart and I saw the hearts of other people. And that like, yeah. was, I was like, oh, that stuff is just always there. Yeah. It's like, all like underneath all that other crap people just like want to be loved and stuff and they like yeah. want to be seen and they like want to talk about how they how they're doing to people they like want people to give a shit about that it's like mm -hmm. oh we're like not so different you're just like there's just like this stuff <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so that that like that like that that realization kind of informs a lot of how i write now just mm -hmm. like assuming it, if only very implicitly in the background that that's going on that people are like basically good that they're basically just very very upset about a lot of things <laughs> mm. and that a lot of the stuff that they're doing on the surface is just like kind of defense mechanisms and compensate and like copes i people i really i'm conflicted about the use of the word cope in the in the in the uh, internet discourse on the one hand i think it's pointing out a real phenomenon that's like important and on the other hand people use it in like a derogatory way derogatory way and i just don't i when i use the word cope it's totally neutral mm -hmm. like there's just copes happening all the time that's just how it is and they're 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 good copes uh -huh. are for coping it's right there in the name. Uh -huh. for coping copes. <laughs> people are good at cope yeah, coping cope, yeah coping people happens cope. and yeah. like people people are like oh this is a cope as if like they don't uh -huh. have copes it's like you, uh -huh. we can talk mm -hmm. about your copes you want to talk about your copes man <laughs> like you can like, cast fun. the first stone if you don't yeah, have any yeah yeah exactly and it's just you know like that i i, I like learned a lot about coping yeah um and I, I, you know, I acquired a lot of, of, of like, uh, compassion for coping. I was like, oh yeah, that's, I do that too all the time. That's fine. That's like, mm. sometimes you just got to deal with your, that's sometimes that's the best option you have for dealing with your feelings. Like, mm. yep, there it is. Uh, but like, I guess I like, that's when I understood that there were, that it was possible to like reach for the people's hearts. Mm. And I think like there are people you can kind of tell on Twitter when a person doesn't believe this, uh, when they just like kind of believe that the world is full of like bastards mm. and that you just have to kind of like look out for yourself. And mm. just like, it's sad. I'm just like, oh man, you, do, you haven't seen the soft, squishy parts mm. underneath underneath the bastardry. It's crazy <laughs> how soft and squishy people can be you know, oh, in here. Uh -huh. like, it's fucking uh -huh. nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, but we were talking about rationality. So that, that happened. It was very... It was another big kind of series of revelations for me on that front. Um, and then I, it was while coming back from one of these experiences, like I had, a, I went to Austin to talk to a bunch of people about my feelings and we had a very nice time. And then I noticed that I was dreading going back to the Bay Area. Mm. I noticed, you know, I had said, I had at that point acquired enough capacity, at least enough capacity to work my feelings to notice stuff like that. I was like, oh, I'm dreading going back to the Bay. I really don't want to go back there. Mm. And I like looked at that. I was like, what's up with that? And part of it was just that, just, just the general atmosphere of being like walking around Berkeley and San Francisco, it just feels bad. Mm. There's like homeless people everywhere. And they're like, obviously it's 
suffering. And I have to like shut myself off from all of that just to like function, just to like get around town. And that doesn't feel good. And that's there's so just that whole vibe compared to Austin. Austin was like so nice. Mm. <laughs> People just seemed happy there. Like I went into mm. a restaurant and I like talked to the waitress a little bit. And I was like, I would never have done that in Berkeley. Uh-huh. No, waitresses don't feel like they're approachable in the slightest. In mm. Berkeley. but people just seemed like happy and relaxed and i just like felt like i could do it and it's just like nice I was like, wow it and and so that that was part of it it's just like i just it just feels bad <laughs> in the mm. uh, but another part of it was that like i had just been around all these people who were so like loving and gushy and emotional and wanted to talk about their feelings all the time and i was like that's great that's what i want right now and then the idea of going back to the bay with the rationalists was just like oh but the rationalists like some of them kind of want to do that and then a lot of them are just like like it, it sort of gradually dawned on me. I was like, oh, a lot of the rationalists are just like, also, they were like me. They were just like kind of like repressed and like kind of tense all the time and anxious. And like, you can hear it in their voice mm. and you can like, and also in their, in, in their, like, you could see it in the kind of like the rigidity of their thought patterns and stuff. Mm. And it's just like, and it makes me feel tense being around them. That was something I came to. It's like, oh yeah, I get more tense and I start getting more like that when I spend too much time around other people who are like that. Like I pick up on their tension and their anxiety and I like internalize and it becomes my tension. Like, and I become like that. And I didn't want that. You know? uh-huh. yeah. like, That's not my idea of a good time anymore. I don't want to do that. Um, so that was, that was kind of the impetus for me to write. Um, I wrote this like 20 page document uh, called It Feels Bad Around Here. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm where I just described a bunch of ways that it felt bad to me to be around the Bay Area rationalists. And I sent that document to a bunch of people. I read it at the time. It was, it was really good. Yeah, thank you. And it was, it was a lot of stuff about it. It's just like, basically it was just like, I think, the rap, I think everybody here is just like really tense and anxious mm-hmm. and they're hiding unimaginable amounts of suffering mm-hmm. and trauma. And that's how it is. And that's kind of why we're all here. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, uh-huh. And, mm. and I don't like how it feels and I think we should talk about it and some people loved it some people like thanked me mm-hmm. they were like thank you for this. <laughs> this was like really like I really needed to hear this and then a couple people a couple people who are kind of I don't want to name names but a couple people who are like high status in the rational like, community got really mad at me um I think because they correctly intuited that I was like wrecking some stuff <laughs> mm-hmm. I was like kind of trying to disrupt something uh some kind of foundation of the community um in fact one of them said that they were like don't destroy the community. Mm-hmm. It's bad. You should. And I was like, did Eliezer Yukowski not tell us that that which can be destroyed by the truth should be? And they were like, uh-huh. no, don't do that. And I was like, okay, but I still kind of think we should do it. Huh. Would you do it differently now? Uh, I would. There were a couple of things I said in there that were kind of tactless. Like I, I, I singled out one guy by name and I regret doing that. That was, mm. tact- I, was I was just pissed, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Um, and there was there was a discussion in the comments this so this once upon a time this was a google doc and there was mm-hmm. like i i sent it to like maybe 60 people or something i was a little bit mad <laughs> mm-hmm. I, i'm like okay with that that part is fine but like i it started this very long discussion i i disabled editing but I turned on commenting so there was just like very large discussion happening in the comments like dozens of people in the comments um and there was like a kind of flame war and i kind of like yelled at some yelled at this one guy and I kind of I regret that like that was unnecessary it didn't help anything I was again just very angry Mm. Um, but I realized you know I I, as I kept doing that I was like oh he can't listen to me (laughs) when I'm like this at the very least so this is just not productive at all and so I guess I'm going to stop and so I think now I would I I would hopefully have just skipped that bit Mm -hmm. Um, but at the time I was like very new to the whole pro- to the whole to being angry at all uh-huh. at the time i was like an exciting exercise I was like who knows what's going to happen maybe it'll be really good maybe yeah. if i'm really angry at this guy something will happen that's good and it turned out that wasn't true but you know it was a, it was like i didn't know that you know, yeah. at the time yeah, i really yeah. genuinely didn't know that uh. but that whole experience really soured me on the rational community and mm. uh, this is this is along with uh, i was working at cfar at the time i uh, i was like oh i should maybe i should like to try to reform the curriculum and like help them improve it in ways that I think are good. And I tried doing a little bit of that, but it was hard because I was still very depressed. And uh, and also like the, the work environment was kind of unmotivating for me in a bunch of ways. Like I didn't really feel like we were kind of all in it together. Uh, I was kind of like the only person on the research team and mm-hmm. everyone else had a bunch of other responsibilities. So there wasn't really anyone I could like really talk to a lot um, about stuff I was thinking about. There's just as much of stuff like that. Um, mm-hmm. 
and also I, I got into a conflict with my boss, uh, which I like, I don't really know how to talk about, but like sure. it was kind of related to all this other stuff. Uh, like there was some emotional dynamics around CIFAR that I was kind of uncomfortable with. And I tried talking about them and it was just very difficult to talk about them. Mm. At some point I just kind of gave up. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna leave. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. think I can, I don't think I can improve the situation on my own. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. And uh, like it, it, it kind of, uh, it seems to me generally that there were ways in which a bunch of really important people in the community were kind of like really rigid and like kind of stuck in a certain way. And they like weren't willing to do the kinds of things that would have like gotten them kind of more open and free flowing. Like there were ways in which I felt like a lot of what was running the community was a, it was a kind of like, a, was a kind of like all encompassing fear and terror. Mm. Uh, the worst case scenario. So like, oh, what happens if, if they are it's really bad? In fact, it's so bad that we should like devote our lives to something that we should like everything else is just less important than this. Like, uh, I actually, I told them, I gave like a little speech when I left. <laughs> mm. And the gist of that speech was like, I don't think you can save the world from a place of fear. Mm -hmm. I don't, I think you have to save the world from a place of love or it's just not going to work. Mm. And I still believe that. I still believe that. Uh, it was very, uh, what's the word? I don't know. It was, it was a kind of very twee or something. But I do still believe. I, do I don't still know. Believe twee that. things can be true. <laughs> twee things can you be know? true, yeah. I mean, I've, I'm doubling down on the twee because they're, they're true sometimes, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's nuance and exceptions and yeah. whatnot to everything. But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it seems true to me. That. Yeah, I do yeah. still believe that. I still, it, fear is still, like, fear, like, makes everything rigid mm -hmm. and like 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 collapses awareness you know mm -hmm. it's like hard to be creative it's hard to think of alternatives it's hard to like change your mind it's hard to like be open to new evidence when you're kind of being run by fear in that way yeah um, and like it's not it's very weird to like there are these people you know who's who talked a good game about like saving the world or whatever and like saving humanity who just like didn't seem to like individual people all that much mm. you know mm -hmm. just like mm. why <laughs> like why philanthropists in the large and misanthropists in the in the particular yeah kind of <laughs> that was like weird i know yeah. I, once i started noticing i was like what's up with that like yeah. i don't know if the world even exists to you in a real way except it's like this abstraction like what's up with that mm -hmm. man that doesn't that seems that seems a little whack something seems a little off about that mm -hmm uh yeah i mean i could keep going but that's those sort of like the major points yeah that makes sense uh um, you, you talked about uh the sort of one of the next chapters after that was sort of getting involved in this cult and uh yeah. you know i can imagine that's a really sensitive topic and you should feel free to say whatever you like but uh sort of a similar question as the last one to the extent that you're willing to share like what hmm, yeah what would you go back and tell yourself or how would you approach that situation now knowing what you know now yeah that's tricky i actually don't know what i would have done differently mm -hmm. um, like you know i was i was i was this was around the time the, the timelines are i don't i don't, I don't want to be too precise about the timelines it's sure be uh, but this was that the cult thing was kind of happening at around the same time mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> And like what drew me to it, and I think what drew other people to it was that there were, were like, there were people there like me who were kind of in the middle of some kind of emotional or spiritual awakening, but they were in the rationality community. And it's just, it's hard to, it's just hard to talk about that stuff in the rationality community. Like I, uh, uh, I remember distinctly there was a, there was an alumni reunion, there was a CIFAR alumni reunion that I was at where I, uh, this must have been in 20. 17 and 2018 i i decided to they have a lot of like lightning talks there you can like come up and give a talk about whatever i decided to give a talk about chakras <laughs> mm. i was like yeah it's gonna be great <laughs> we're gonna uh -huh. we're gonna learn about chakras uh -huh. and i the main bulk of the talk was like it was very little like explanation i was like okay there i claim that there are these things called chakras i was actually introduced to chakras by other rationalists um, mm. who just happen who happened to be on the woo side they're like yeah chakras they're kind of real you can like kind of do stuff with them. i was like whoa chakras uh -huh. and i did some stuff I was like, oh yeah i can kind of do stuff with them that's crazy and so i like you know i was like okay there is like these 
approximately seven points in your body. And if you concentrate on them and like try to put energy into them, maybe some interesting stuff will happen. And I just like made the audience do that. The audience was like maybe 20 people. And I just like made them do that. <laughs> I was mm-hmm. like, okay, now we're going to sit down and you're going to concentrate on your root chakra and mm-hmm. just see what happens. And like maybe some put some energy into it or just like, I think the specific instruction I gave was like, imagine a ball of energy where that thing, like mm-hmm. in that location. Um, and then, then I just had them do it. And people were like shaking and all sorts of stuff all sorts of stuff is happening i wouldn't do this anymore i now Uh i think that that is an unsafe thing to do (laughs) Uh and i would i would i think there are safer ways to to introduce someone to that sort of thing but at the time i was just very excited and also like uh kind of what's we're feeling mischievous i was like ha yes i will introduce the rationalist to chakras it'll be funny (laughs) you Mm -hmm. know they'll be forced to contend with energy <laughs> it's a phenomenon wouldn't that be funny <laughs> so there was a, it was a little bit trolly but also i really i did want to introduce people to it like that was a yeah. desire um and one person was like very critical because there was like oh it's like what is it what is this community coming to now we have talked about chakras this uh, mm-hmm. this is not very not very rational at all <laughs> you know like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and it was just one guy but i really didn't i, I felt like he kind of represented a, a spirit of like a whole side of the community that was just like very firmly opposed to this whole thing i was like no none of this we're here to be more rational not like more mm-hmm. irrational and this is very, very irrational stuff like we can't we can't be having this and I, you know and that was very unsatisfying because i really wanted to learn about this whack shit you know? yeah it's like i'm having these experiences where i get to concentrate energy in, in my chakras and stuff happens and uh-huh. i had a bunch of other I, there's a bunch of other experiences like that. i had enough experiences to believe that there was something real going on and it was very frustrating to see the rationalist who claims to be empiricist refusing to empirically examine this phenomenon i mean something mm-hmm. We're just like oh yeah we're too good to empirically examine that phenomenon it's like that's stupid <laughs> you're mm-hmm. dumb don't mm-hmm. do that this is a phenomenon that you can investigate all you have to do is believe that when you feel things that there's something that that counts as an observation that's all you have to believe and like yeah i was very frustrated by this reaction i was just like this is stupid and then meanwhile there were this there was this kind of subgroup of people that i was that i was invited to that was like very into this stuff. There was like, oh yeah, we are totally cool with chakras and feelings and all of that crazy stuff. And in fact, we have our own kind of uh, <laughs> system for thinking about that, about all that stuff. And you're welcome to come hang out with us and we can talk about magic and stuff basically. And I was like, that sounds great. Like they were, they were filling a need that I had no other way to fill. There was no one else I could talk about this stuff with. It was just them. Um, so yeah, so that's so that, that, that's sort of the basic reason why I don't know if I would have done anything differently. Like I. I think it wasn't, I think it was in some sense good for me to be involved in that group, even though it did kind of, did blow up and that was like unpleasant. Mm. Um, but I, 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 I do think I actually got a lot of stuff out of it. And I like, hopefully, you know, in my interactions with people other than the cult leader, I think good things happened. And mm. I, and I had like adventures, you know, I went to Burning Man and I had an adventure at Burning Man and that was like very nice. So it, it, it's really, it's like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like a good stuff intertwined with the bad stuff. And it's like hard mm. for me to know what to do with that. Like, I don't, I don't know what I would, I would tell myself to do differently if mm. we go back. Like, there's like a couple of things that's just like, oh, there's like things I could have done to be kinder. There's things I could have done to like enable the cult leader less and try to like, maybe like uh, empower everyone else more. There's, mm. there's things like that I could have done sort of like minor adjustments, but like, uh, I think I, I overall don't actually regret getting involved. Hmm. I think it was good. It was very exciting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a very dramatic period of my life. <laughs> sure, sure. Happened, yeah. yeah, part part of the reason to ask is just because, um, oh, I know cults are a recurring phenomena and people have been and will be in cults. And I imagine uh, it's it's sort of, you know, about your own experience, of course, but like if there's advice you'd pass on to someone that, found themselves enmeshed in some kind of cult situation, what you would say to such a person? So there's this like, this is partly addressing that question and partly addressing the question of like, uh, sort of addressed to a broader population of like, what's the deal with all this stuff? And like, Mm. what should I do if like one of my friends is in some kind of culty situation? Um, I think there's a pretty tight analogy between like abusive cults and abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. They're they're quite similar and they run on quite similar dynamics in many ways. 
And one of the things people say about abusive relationships is that if you like, uh, how do I phrase this? If you're like, if you make someone feel like an idiot for being in an abusive relationship, they're not going to talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like if, if the, if the story you have about how abusive relationships work is like, obviously you should leave. And like, if you don't leave, then you're dumb. Then like, they're not going to talk to you about it. Mm. And I think like, I like similarly with cults, like I think people have this impression that people have to be kind of tricked into joining cults. I like what about like cults Like you can only get tricked into joining a cult if you're like dumb in some way. And that's not really how it is. Like if you look at, how if you look at there's statistics available for what kinds of people join cults and they're often like very educated intelligent people Mm -hmm. um the thing that i would say this this sort of short thing that i would say about like why people and for that matter why people stay in abusive relationships is like there's something important that they're getting there that they're not getting anywhere else Mm. that's it that was certainly true in my situation i have since read a lot about cults not a lot i've read a little bit about cults and that's true in other cult situations as well there's like something they're getting from this place that they're not getting anywhere else and that's why they're staying Mm-hmm. and like that that i think is a, is a very general principle of how to understand other people just like if they if you see someone else doing something really weird just assume that they're getting something out of it and kind mm-hmm. of wonder what that is and that's just true here. like there are there are there are like ways in which i was listened to by those people that i wasn't being listened to by anyone else and that was like very valuable to me and i really wanted and needed that uh, and so i think if you want if you think there's something very harmful about a situation like that, that you or a person that you know is in, uh, I think this is again, addressing the like, what if my friend is in a situation like this? If, if a person you know is in a situation like this, probably the best thing you can do for them is demonstrate genuine willingness to actually listen to what's actually going on for them. In particular, to listen to like the things that they feel like they can't talk about with anybody except those people except Mm. that abusive partner or with that cult or whatever like demonstrate genuine willingness to listen to whatever that stuff is and that stuff may be very weird that stuff may be much weirder than you're prepared to deal with like people might talk about like you know their energy experiences they might talk about hallucinations they might talk about like feeling like they've been literally possessed by demons or some shit and you just like if you really want to help them you have to learn how to be okay with that you have to Mm. be like I like you have, to, you have to like be willing to not dismiss that out of hand but there's a lot of weird shits that can happen and there's a lot of theories you could have about what kind of thing that weird shit is mm-hmm. but as long I, I i think it's okay to be agnostic about whether any of that stuff is real as long as you just demonstrate a genuine willingness to listen to someone talk about it mm-hmm. and not think that they're crazy mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. That's like really great. I think if you got that, then people can actually talk to you. And then for the person who's actually in that situation, it's like, oh, what if I'm in in some kind of culty situation? What if I'm in some, uh, this is maybe less true of abusive relationships, but like, uh, but for the culty situations, like, I guess to those people, like, I would say that, the, the, the real answer is I would say they should read Mark Littman's protocol doc it's really good it has a whole section um it's on it's at meditationbook.page yeah. i believe and there's an extensive section about cults and it's one of the best things i've ever read uh it, it includes like like mark makes space for sort of maximum weirdness just mm-hmm. like really really weird stuff that other people don't talk about that people like don't know how to talk about it's like outside of western scientific materialism whatever he just talks about all of it it's great Mm. and uh one of the things he's i I think this is the thing that he says there which i really liked was like one of the things that keeps people stuck in these situations is the feeling like that the cult or the cult leader is like their only source of like real knowledge there's like like maybe they're the only person who's really willing to talk about like esoteric spiritual stuff and you're like oh man these are the only people who talk about this stuff this is like the only place where i can get this kind of like knowledge that i desperately need for my life and and i think it's important to know that it's not true that there are many spiritual teachers there are many spiritual traditions there are many spiritual weirdos out there who can talk about this stuff and who have good things to say about it there are like many sources of wisdom you really do not have to all get it from one person or one group, especially if that person or group is really hurting you a lot in the meantime, you actually can get the good stuff about the bad stuff. It actually is possible. I think that's mm-hmm. like, like I, I wouldn't, I didn't really know that. Mm-hmm. 
at the time or I wouldn't have believed it. I've been like, well, maybe they are, but they wouldn't talk to me. Like mm. <laughs> they're not accessible to me. They're like somewhere else. That's not where I am. Uh, Twitter has actually been really cool for this. I really appreciate how, how willing people are to be like esoteric on Twitter and just like talk about crazy spiritual stuff. Like that's been really great to me as, as a counter to this, like, oh yeah. I'm like not alone. There's like all these <laughs> other weirdos on Twitter who talk mm-hmm. about this stuff. That's great. Like that's totally. genuinely very helpful. Totally. Yeah, I, you said that like one of the things that drew you to this cult was like that they were willing to talk about stuff that was outside of the scientific materialist worldview mm-hmm. that a lot of the rationalists were in. And mm-hmm. uh, we we talked about this last time we met up, but uh, we had a long talk about like whether materialism was a valid philosophy or not. And um, Mm. I think you were maintaining that there was like a way to hold some things about materialism that was uh, like more encompassing of certain phenomena in these things. But in in any case, I'd be curious to hear like how you view those kinds of questions now with like materialism and all of these weird phenomena that people can report and how you think about that now. So maybe I'll start by describing some weird things that I've experienced or that like are that are like secondhand, but not thirdhand, like that a person I know has experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know at least one person who reports having uh, like kind of prophetic dreams, like they mm-hmm. dream about a thing and then it happens and people and the skeptics will be like, well, that was just a coincidence mm-hmm. or whatever. And I like, don't think that anymore. I think there's some, there's something kind of real about that. Um, one of the, one of the things that happened to me at Burning Man was that I, uh, another person in my camp took a mix of psychedelics and prescription medicine that was probably not a good idea to take. Uh, but the result, the effect it had on him was extremely interesting. He, mm. um, he sort of lost the, he lost a bunch of his ability to sensory gate. Like he couldn't stop himself from being aware of like a bunch of sens- things that he was experiencing that ordinarily he would have filtered out. And it was very unpleasant for him. Like uh, we had to, we had to be very quiet and like move carefully the entire rest of the night Mm. uh, because anything else was kind of excruciating for him. Like if someone was talking with consonants that were too harsh, 10 feet away from him, that was intolerable. Like he couldn't Mm. handle that. And so we all, we we all had to learn how to talk very softly, not just quietly, but like soft consonants. And, And he had to have a person holding his hand and that the person holding his hand had to have very very firm had to have like very stable posture and if that person had like was sitting in a way that like put too much pressure on a part of their hip like he couldn't Mm. tell he claimed to be able to tell through the hand and he had to be like could you please like shift your hip a little bit to the side so that it's not so that it's like a little more stable Mm. like i had no reason to disbelieve him you know he was you know, he was like suffering. This wasn't like him showing off. This was him suffering. He was like, please do that so that I hurt less. Mm. You know, I had like no reason to believe that he was making that up. And I was just like, I just think this is really possible. Like, I think there's all this sensory information that you're getting as a human being all the time. And almost all of it is being filtered out so that you don't have to deal with it consciously because you don't, most of the time you don't have to deal with it consciously. Um, but it seems apparently that it is sometimes possible for a person to consciously get access to all that stuff. That's wild. That's like pretty crazy, but it's not, it's perfectly materialist. Like all you have to do is posit that sometimes it's possible to sensory gate less. And that's, that seems, that seems totally plausible to me. I was like, okay, I believe that people can have like such high, like sensory, oh, our connection's a little unstable now, I guess. Did you catch all that? Yeah, I did. Yep. Okay, cool. So I, that was like a, that was like a, a bit of an eye-opening experience. I was like, oh, people can be very sensitive. They can like have access in, to just a bunch of their senses. And that seems like a, there's like enough raw data there that I could believe that the, that the human body mind is capable of making a bunch of inferences from that data. That's sort of the foundation of, of how I think about like, about this kind of woo stuff, but from a firmly uh, materialist reductionist, this is like, all this is compatible with reductionist materialism actually. Um, How would you describe what, reductionist materialism is from your perspective like you know physics is true stuff is made out of atoms there's not like there doesn't have to be like a separate spiritual plane on which spiritual things happen like it can kind of just all happen here Mm -hmm. Um, it can kind of all happen through 
electromagnetism and stuff. Like it can mm. really just be photons uh, that are like and sound waves. Like light and sound could potentially account for everything. All you have to do is posit that the the body mind takes in a shit ton of data, which is definitely true, and that the body mind is capable of making occasionally very unusual inferences from that data, which I think is very possible. Hmm. What would the alternative be like if you rejected materialism? What it, what is it that you're preserving by having this uh, sort of broader materialism that encompasses these phenomena? So one person I know claims to have had a dream about like a not exactly prophetic but like a kind of prophetic ish dream about one of their siblings while one of them was in the u.s and one of them was in japan but just mm -hmm. separated by like a long distance and one of the things that i don't know how to explain is though that i less know how to explain is that kind of like things where people are just separated by very long distances like th things like i don't know um you had a dream about your aunt dying and the next day you heard that they died but you also that you live in like separate countries like just, mm -hmm. it's unclear what like sort of where the where how the information could have traveled to the physical distance and yeah is and so a, if, is I, if i believed in like a separate spiritual plane on which that information could have traveled to you then certain things would become more understandable that are current that are current i do actually think it's i currently actually believe it's possible for the information to travel that distance um physically and the reason I believe that is because the internet exists. Um, uh -huh. Like, I, I think you might be able to pick up very subtle cues from things like that. I, but this, this that's a uh -huh. very wild speculation. But it, it's strained. It's definitely like a strained explanation. And it, it would be a simpler explanation if I believed there was like a non-physical plane on which that kind of stuff could happen. I see. Yeah, I think um, it's really interesting to hear you talk about this because it's it's in some ways not so far from my conclusions, but I think like um, something like you're uh, upholding or striving for certain values that I might not like work so hard to preserve or something, but but yeah. it's not that far from where I'm at either. Um, yeah, I should uh, say part of it is just that I've noticed about myself that like some parts of me seem to believe like scientific materialism very deeply actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for bad reasons, I think literally just because I read a bunch of astronomy books when I was a kid. <laughs> mm. hmm. And so like, I could imagine that softening in the future, but for now, some parts of me believe scientific materialism very strongly. And fortunately, I still believe that like spiritual phenomena can be accommodated in that frame. Mm -hmm. I currently still believe that. So everyone, yeah. everything's sort of in like a state, in like a, not a stalemate, but is it like a, a they're, they're like at peace for now. Mm -hmm. w would it be fair to summarize your perspective as follows? Something like um, math and science have strong explanatory power. Uh, and um, also you've had strange phenomena happen to you. Uh, and you, you've heard other people report things that seem strange and you're inclined to believe them typically. Yeah. And how the, all those things fit together is not completely clear to you at this time, but like you want to uphold the value of math and science as ex explaining phenomena and also without like disbelieving your own experience or other people's experiences. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, th I think I'm like very much on the same page. I wouldn't be trying to, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I have to do some more introspection about this, but I'm not like trying to uphold materialism specifically, but I, 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 it would be stupid to be like math and science don't have explanatory power and the things aren't real or something. Uh, sure. Yeah. So anyway, it's interesting to hear where you're coming from and, and see. I, I think we were on a similar page a couple of years ago too, but it's, it's just mm -hmm. um, nice to see that pretty, on, pretty much on a similar page. Yeah. So is there anything more you want to say about that? Uh -huh. Nothing that immediately I, I I could I could describe some more stories I've heard from people I know that I'm inclined to believe. Mm -hmm. um, you know that might be valuable because uh, I, part of where I'm coming from is like I, I've had so many weird experiences that like mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't be believed by many people uh, that oh. I would talk to. So 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 anyway, it's just like it's it's like 
you're like, Hey, I've had weird experiences. I've heard weird things. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a Tuesday today. I think Let me double check, Tuesday. you know, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. like, all right, like, cool. I've had weird stuff. You've had weird stuff, but I imagine there's yeah. someone else that's listening that that might not be in that position or yeah, yeah. would be curious Something to hear more. Be. So I can just tell uh, us. Like, yeah, I have most of the weird stuff is stuff that's happened to people. I know, like, uh -huh. I, I don't think that I've experienced anything that couldn't, that isn't just like intuition. Uh -huh. Yeah, like I've experienced things. I've been like, wow, I guess I have intuitions about things. That's cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, but other people have experienced weirder things. So, for example, uh, another guy. He's just like a guy. Um, he like if you looked at him, you'd think he was like a like a longshoreman or something, <laughs> or mm -hmm. like a former football player. But um, he told me that when he was a teenager, he was. I don't actually remember if this was even drug induced. He, he was tripping or something one day and he entered an altered state for the rest of the day. And in that altered state, he claimed to be able to like see what was happening a few seconds into the future. Mm -hmm. like he walked into a store and the, there was a clerk and he was like, he had a sense that he knew what the clerk was going to say and yeah. the clerk said exactly those things. And that lasted for the rest of the day and then went away and then never came back again. <laughs> that, 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 that happens to me all of the time. Like really? constantly, yeah. Wow. Uh, or frequent. Yeah. I should say frequently, not constantly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I I believe that that sort of thing is possible, and the reason yeah. I believe that sort of thing is possible, I guess there's actually there's actually two two at least two ways it could go. One of which is sort of, but the the version I'm inclined to believe, uh, is again the same thing I mentioned. I think people, you know, absorb huge amounts of data from the environment, mm -hmm. and under some circumstances, you can make some very strong inferences from that data. Like the 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 data is rich enough. And I believe that the human body mind is powerful enough of an inference engine to make those kinds of inferences, to just be able to, under some circumstances, make predictions a few seconds of the future. And, mm -hmm. and, those, mm -hmm. and, and those predictions could just surface as like visions or whatever. I just like believe that that sort of thing is possible. Mm -hmm. I just, I yeah, just and there's uh, over here, it's there. like hard for, I, I feel the same way about energy. Like I, I was very skeptical of energy and then I started experiencing it in my own body. And it's like, okay, mm. I'm <laughs> like, I'm currently, as we speak, experiencing energy in my body. It's like, this is a thing. Yeah. If someone just, wants to tell me that it's not real, like, mm, just like come, come over here in my body. Like, <laughs> yeah, like I don't know, know what to tell you. I, like... I can't be against my own experience. So yeah, I, I mean, I've frequently had that kind of thing for years and like someone can have their own ideas about what that is, but I, I can't dispute my own experience of that sort of thing happening frequently. Yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've also done experiments. So I did this at the, the alumni workshop I mentioned. I would tell someone to put energy in a chakra mm. and not tell them the kinds of things, like I wouldn't tell them what the likely associations were. You know, there's some, you know, I've been told like, oh, this chakra is for this thing and this other chakra is for this other thing. And I just wouldn't tell people any of those things. And I just, I just put energy in there and see what happens. And then sometimes uh, the hit rate isn't actually amazing, but sometimes they'll be like, oh, it's like this. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's like the kind of thing that happens in that chakra. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't even think it's necessarily always like that. Like Mark says that sometimes the wiring can be different and stuff can end up in different places. Mm. And the chakras can be in different locations or whatever. Right. Um, but I, I've at least seen enough of that kind of thing to be like, okay, there are definitely centers in the body where energy pools or like does something. There's like, definitely more meaningful bits than other bits mm. and at least some of those bits seem to have like pretty firm like one of those you know the the gut stuff is just like well the enteric nervous system is like a whole thing in there there's like a i, I looked this up once and i just like having this as a as a sound bite there's a kitten's worth of neurons down there mm. and supposedly their basic job is to regulate digestion and stuff but they do a lot of they do a lot of the things that are like very clearly related to emotional processing mm -hmm. um, like there's fear responses down there and stuff like i certainly you know, notice in my own life that when I get nervous about things, I start poop, like I poop before I, things I'm nervous about. Yeah. <laughs> and, like, that stuff I'm pretty sure is being regulated by the entire nervous system. And I'm pretty sure there's weirder stuff. Like I think it's related to gut health and related to like depression and anxiety and like just all sorts of stuff that's going on in there. That again, I think is, is first of all, fully compatible with scientific materialism. And second of all, like not well understood. Mm. Currently. I think people mm -hmm. just don't understand what's going on here very well. And that, like just normal research normal medical research will uncover things about this area that we just like currently don't know, uh, which is cool. It's like yeah. cool to have that to look forward to. Like I hope yeah, yeah. one day that we understand that stuff, that'd be pretty great. <laughs> totally. Yeah, I've had this metaphor recently with like the energy body in particular of like, mm, I don't know, it feels like I'm like learning a new language and I know there is a new language and I like know some words and phrases in the language and can have like 
pretty bad conversations, but there's like, <laughs> but I'm not fluent. And I know that fluency is possible. And like, what would that be? And um, yeah, just, just like that, that there's much more to the energy body than I'm currently able to comprehend or use or uh, yeah, understand and like practically in the, and then I could apply it. So I yeah. feel like there's a lot more to learn, certainly for me here, but also broadly for humanity. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's cool stuff. It's exciting yeah. stuff. Yeah, maybe we could circle back to the sort of like emotional processing, self-therapy type stuff. You you mentioned uh, Genlin focusing and that that was kind of like a, a key point. And um, could you could you kind of talk about what what you did from there and what other things you've explored in that territory? Yeah, so. Oh, excuse me almost everything i've done has been very verbal like a mm -hmm. lot of like it's almost all of it is involved on some level verbalizing something mm -hmm. and that's consistently been very powerful for me and i there are some uh, there are other people i think for whom that would be less impactful but like for whatever reason like a lot of stuff for me seems to be uh seems to be locked up in or tied behind tied in, tied into verbalization um so the main the main other thing that comes to mind this might not be in chronological but uh so after all the cult stuff went down uh some the next summer this was in 2019 is that right 2019 2019 summer of 2019 um i attended a biomotive framework workshop run by doug tatarin um, which we were both at yeah I, yeah i was there with that yeah oh you were at that one yeah oh that's right because it was at me <laughs> yeah that was yeah. when we met for the first time yeah oh shit oh shit nice that's right mm -hmm. yeah so that was really, uh, Doug has this whole, I learned a lot of really cool stuff at that workshop. Um, in particular, among the many things, uh, Doug has this concept of like interpersonal feelings. Mm -hmm. um, he says that like a lot of, a lot of, and maybe most of what a lot of, most of what feelings are trying to do is to express our best guesses about what's happening in our interpersonal, for, to us interpersonally. And uh, I had sort of gotten used to, uh, there's this, there's this kind of trend in like circling and nonviolent communication and related things where you try to be like, um, you try to distinguish what they call feelings from what they call stories. So a feeling might be like, I feel angry or I feel sad or I feel afraid. And a story might be like, you're an asshole. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'd be like, well, no, that's not, you know, you can't just say like, you know, when someone asks you like, how are you feeling? It's like, I feel like you're an asshole. It's like, well, that's, that's not a feeling. You know, those mm -hmm. guys are like, that's, that's not a feeling. You're an asshole is not a feeling. That's a story that you have about them being an asshole, but it's not a feeling. And there's this, there's this, there's this underlying um, thing about like, you can sort of trust feelings more than stories. Like feelings are kind of undeniable. Like you're definitely upset, but he, that other guy may or may not be an asshole. Mm -hmm. You may find that you can kind of like let go of that story eventually or something. So they have that distinction and it's a useful distinction. And what Doug, what I learned from Doug, or what I claim to have learned from Doug, is that a lot of things that I was calling stories are what Doug would call interpersonal feelings. Mm. There are things like, you betrayed me. Mm. Like, you know, NVC and some circling people might be like, well, that's a story. But I learned from just trying it out with Doug that like, there is a way it feels to feel like someone has betrayed you. Mm -hmm. And it is different from just feeling angry or sad or scared hurts mm -hmm. there's like a distinct feeling and like it matters whether that feeling is expressed or not uh, that was like a, that was really that was like, and those I ones learned. usually have this sort of like ed ending of like i was disrespected or yeah, yeah betrayed as you that. said or abandoned was, or lo or love yeah, they was, can be positive yeah, yeah yeah betrayed and abandoned are really the big ones for <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're like they're very they're they're like strong words mm. you know like there's mm. these are very like dramatic D words disrespected has been a big one for me for whatever oh, reason disrespected, feel disrespected yeah. a lot of the time <laughs> oh man yeah, yeah that's that seems real that's like a whole thing yeah so, so that opened opened my, like that brought my attention to like a whole category of, of things mm -hmm. that i had been kind of neglecting and it was really important like it was important for me to process some of the cult stuff that went down like mm -hmm. i had to say out loud like i feel abused mm -hmm. like, that was not a thing mm -hmm. that i had given voice to and i like cried a lot about that i was like oh shit i guess i felt that way i guess that was there the whole time i was trying to kind of deny that i felt hurt by the situation in some mm -hmm. ways and and that really helped me like open up to something. oh yeah i did feel abused that's like a, the word for how i feel 
Thanks, and you're sort of implying there that like uh, that's an okay thing to say as opposed to the story of like you're an asshole or, or whatever a story is that like it, because it's in the feeling thing it's it's more valid to say yeah it? it's 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 like you're an asshole is is kind of like uh, like I wouldn't say like oh well that's just a story but I would say like well when you say like when you when you're trying to express the thing as you're an asshole you're like leaving out the impact it's having on you mm. um, whereas if you say I feel disrespected that's like oh like that's an impact like the impact is that you feel disrespected that's mm -hmm. and so i think the so i would i would sort of uh maybe recommend like focusing on impact but it doesn't have to be all the way to like oh i felt angry like, mm -hmm. like it can involve like a wider range of words yeah uh, describing impacts hmm. i think i uh cut you off there just to clarify is there is there more you wanted to say about that about the yeah, like system. but learning biomotive and what that was like for you and uh yeah, it was just really good and so another thing i got from that was he focused so a lot of the uh, there's there's a there's a lot of stuff in there but uh, like he focuses a lot on crying specifically which you mm -hmm. know i liked crying but i didn't really have a i often found myself kind of stuck like there were yes. kind of tears that would like want to come out and I wouldn't know how to make them come out. And Doug was like, here's how you make them come out. It's like, <laughs> oh, I can make them come out. That's crazy. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. And like the, the basic prescription that Doug suggested was to kind of like, um, so specifically he has these things called the nine core feelings mm. um, that are like different kinds of like, uh, the story goes is that he was doing general focusing with his clients. He was a, he was a therapist and, um, he was, he was trying to specifically get people to voice feelings that would make them cry. Mm -hmm. And he had recorded patterns in that, in how that happened. He would ask people, I think it was something like, you know, they, someone would express something they were upset about. He would say, is that the core of your pain? Mm -hmm. And if they said no, he would like keep going until they said something. And then he'd be like, is that the core of your pain? And they said, yes, that's the core. That's why they're called the core feelings. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I can list all of them, but there are things like, um, I feel hopeless. I feel powerless. Um, alone, which you mentioned. Alone. Yeah, I yeah. feel alone. It's like these, again, these like very big words, and they're not. They're not like ang none of them are like angry and sad. He calls those emotions. Mm -hmm. These are feelings. He distinguishes between emotions and feelings. And we're, like for him, like emotions. For him, there are literally four emotions, <laughs> mm -hmm. and they're happy, angry, sad, and afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and so I often like to start there because these are sort of like the kind of the easiest stuff to get access to in some sense. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, let's start with the emotions. For him, mm -hmm. emotions are kind of like body states, mm -hmm. they're kind of like prime you in certain ways. Like happiness is a body state that primes you in certain directions, and anger is a body state. But what, what's mis what's missing from these is like semantic content. Like emotions don't have by themselves. Um, when you express I feel angry or I feel sad, like you're not those aren't by themselves uh, like a story about what's happening to you whereas i feel betrayed or i feel alone is much more that's a story you know mm -hmm. i feel betrayed like i feel betrayed and i feel alone is a story about what's happening to you mm -hmm. um, and that's the stuff that doug calls feelings and that was like a that was a huge another big upgrade i was like whoa this distinction is like so interesting and makes so much sense to me um, and yeah so another part of the of the thing is that Doug claims that like getting to the core feelings one way or another is like how you like really cry super good. It's how you like, mm -hmm. cry in a way that like such that you can really let it out and you can like kind of finish the grieving process. And I just got to experience this repeatedly. Like I just did that a bunch mm -hmm. on several things. And then I felt much better afterwards. Like I felt easily the best I've ever felt in my entire life. Like I felt light and happy and joyful. And I like experienced some kind of mini jhana thing. Like my body was tingling all over. And there was a night that I got incredibly horny, just really, <laughs> really, really ridiculously horny. I had the best orgasm of my entire life. I was like spontaneously fantasizing about impregnating my female friends. That had uh -huh. never happened before. Normally uh -huh. I would have been too, it would have been too scary to even deliberately fantasize about that, but I was spontaneously fantasizing about it. I was like, wow, this is crazy. My mm -hmm. something about my sexuality is like really turned the fuck up right now. Uh-huh. And I Amazing. released like a bunch of tension in my legs and other parts of my body. And like uh, someone, someone at the monastery at the end of, this is like a week long workshop. At the end of the workshop, they were like, you look like your own cousin. 
Mm -hmm. That's how different your face looks mm -hmm. <laughs> compared to how it looked when you walked in. Like, like just tension had just melted off of my whole body. And I, my shoes didn't fit. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I released yeah. so much tension in my feet uh -huh. <laughs> that it changed the shape of my feet. And I was like, is that even real? And then I asked some people and they're like, oh, yeah, apparently it happens to some to women during pregnancy. I was like, okay. Wow. <laughs> so it's possible. Uh -huh. Change the shape of your feet. <laughs> Yeah, I'm crying. Like, this is this is crazy. It was just like the largest physiological change that I'd ever experienced over the course of a week, probably. Mm. And very sadly, it didn't last. But I'm like, you know, I knew it was possible. I was like, okay, it's possible to cry so much that you almost experience jhana and you like open yourself up sexually and your feet change shape. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. That's so yeah, cool. yeah. It's really exciting. There was also a, an experience. This is not really. I don't even know if this is answering your question. This is just other stuff that I like to talk about. Um, when I went to the airport afterwards, I was like, like people, like people did double takes. They were like <laughs> looking, they were like, what is going on in this direction? You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the story I like to tell about that is that people were like noticing that I was very calm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and it's not very often that you're around someone who's actually very calm. I'm sure you have experienced this too. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they're just like, wow, just feels good in that direction that's so mm -hmm, weird mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> and sadly i can't stabilize it because it seems very attractive to women like it, it, mm -hmm. was, it was women specifically were like looking at me which yeah. never happens normally um and i just found that so interesting i was like wow i'm like really putting out some shit into the universe right now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was that was like another like very striking experience like, wow, so this stuff really works this is, this is crazy stuff so focusing was big and biomotive was big for you. Were there any other sort of uh, methods or techniques that you found really helpful? So there's this funny thing where I like talk about internal family systems. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, you have parts and you can dialogue with those parts, but I almost never do it. Mm -hmm. um, I find it very difficult to do actually. Mm -hmm. uh, usually when I do it, I like when I'm like, when I try to ask my parts questions, be like, what's going on for you right now? Usually mm -hmm. they're just scream. Honestly. Yeah. That's usually what happens. And so I've, I've, I've actually had very little success with huh. doing IFS in, in huh. sort of the ways that I've seen it presented in books. And the closest thing I can get to it is I just like blend with different parts in turn. Mm. I just like, I just like start trying to name some stuff in like a German focusing or biomotive way. And that will sort of accomplish the, that will sort of get me to blend with a certain part. And I'll just like say some stuff in the perspective of that part. And then maybe I'll like blend with a different part and say some stuff in the perspective of that part. Um, but rarely am I like asking a question of a part and getting an answer back while being separated from it. That's, mm. I mostly don't do that. It doesn't work very well for me, actually. Mm. Mm. Sadly, it'd be nice if it did. I could probably guess, do some more stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I was in a pretty similar position and I, I was only able really to do it at first with the help of someone like facilitating for me. And then mm -hmm. someone um, at the monastery suggested that I try getting into like bliss states or jhanas first oh, uh, yeah. and then that that helps and actually there was a feedback loop of like the deeper i went into one the deeper i could go into the other and then oh, kind of go back and forth cool. so so if those are available uh the lighter jhanas i know i always i was always afraid to talk about it because i know people who are like uh there's the john those aren't real jhanas these are yeah you know but Fake. anyway <laughs> yeah anyway if you can get into that territory it's really helpful yeah i mostly can't sadly mm -hmm. there was a period where i uh, I could do something. There was mm -hmm. like something that felt a, seemed like a little bit, like I could do a little bit mini jhana, mm -hmm. but I mostly can't anymore. Uh, I agree sure. that if I could, it would be very helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair, fair, fair. Uh, yeah, oh, so I have, what's that? Oh, I, I was going to say, I remembered a third thing that I mm, Please. Um, which is, this, this happened much later. This was in the last six months, I want to say. Um, but some friends of mine came across this thing called the ideal parent for, mm, for call, mm -hmm. which we talked a little bit about earlier, um, which is really quite different in feel from other stuff I've done. It's, it's, it's what uh, I think some people use the term. It's an imaginal practice mm -hmm, imagined mm -hmm. stuff. And the basic, you know, basically you're like imagining an ideal parent. It's right there. In there. You're imagining an ideal parent for your, like, what would it sort of an ideal parent to do for you in this, in some situation, like, would they comfort you? Would they like hold you? Would they like tell you that they love you? Or whatever, like whatever it is that, that an ideal parent is supposed to do. Like, what if you imagine someone doing that for you? And uh, and so I, I I tried some of that. I tried it some of it by myself. Some of it with some guided meditations in this course that that some people were were running. And it was very intense, very 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 intense. I had a lot of resistance to it. And when I tried getting into it, like I like just it was I I I spiked up to like 
I went from zero to a hundred in my emotional reactions in like two minutes from trying to do this. So there's just, there's, which was cool. I was like, okay, obviously there's some really intense <laughs> shit going on here. Yeah, yeah. Like That's I, usually I a good sign that had, there's stuff I already there. knew I had a lot of feelings about my parents. You know, through biomotive, I had already done a lot of crying about my parents. I was like, obviously I have a lot of, it's like, yep, not surprising. That's how it goes. Um, but this was like a whole nother level. It was like, there were, there were parts of me that like, it was, it was agonizing to believe that it was possible to be treated well in that way. Like mm. it was agonizing. I was like, mm-hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. Um, and so I had, I had to kind of proceed slowly with that stuff. And I, I had to, I spent a lot of time being very angry at the idea of parents. I was like, how dare you try to be nice to me? Mm. <laughs> Fuck you. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff like that. Uh, but it did really seem to do something. Like I, I barely did it. I did it like a, like, I tried it like maybe once or twice a week for like maybe a month, like just very little. And I, I think even that small amount of practice, like noticeably decreased the extent to which I was like worried about what other people thought of me and things like mm-hmm. that, like mm-hmm. anxious attachment kind of symptoms. Like mm-hmm. those things meaningfully improved. Like I, it, not all the way, because I didn't do very much of it. Like they say you need like months or like a year of it or something to like really make a lot of several years, attachment. I think. Yeah. Several years maybe. Yeah. But like, I could, it was doing something. I was like, wow, my attachment stuff has gotten better. That's fucking mm. crazy. <laughs> like, totally, totally. I haven't gone back to it because it's still very scary. <laughs> mm. But uh, but that was like, that was really cool. And it was also, again, like quite different from anything else I've done in a really interesting way. Like this idea, just what if you imagine stuff? Like I learned that I wasn't very good at imagining things mm. in some sense. So like I couldn't imagine things in a very detailed way. Um, but I did also learn that I could kind of like, the ideal parent figure i like kind of don't have to i don't have to like think about what they should do and like have them do it like i can kind of run them autonomously mm-hmm. like there's a part of us that just kind of knows what we want mm-hmm. um, and it can just kind of happen so that was, that was cool uh, cool but again it's, it's not something i do very often because it's just still difficult for me uh, mm-hmm. but, but it's, it's cool and like okay this could be good this could be in fact maybe really important mm-hmm. like maybe maybe we need this real bad uh, so, uh, so focusing uh, biomotive to some extent, IFS to some extent, IPF. Mm-hmm. Any other major things that you've explored or have been helpful to you with kind of self therapy stuff? So there's there's more somatic stuff. Um, mm. There's this guy Peter Levine who does this thing called somatic experiencing, and I don't actually know what it is, mm. um, and I've not actually, I know I haven't like looked up a course or anything like that um but i know some people who've done it and i like picked up a tiny handful of things from them uh, they have there's this concept where um so people will tell this story of like uh this thing that gazelles or something do when they're like being attacked by lions is they'll like mm-hmm. go limp and kind of like wait for the lion to leave hopefully and like if the lion leaves they'll kind of like shake out a bunch of tension mm-hmm. in their bodies that they were kind of holding because they were playing dead and waiting for the line to leave and then they like go about their lives and the claim is that is that this is like a common thing in animals and the humans in particular are supposed to be doing something like this and they often don't like you can go through a very traumatizing experience and then just like there can be all this physical tension locked up in your body that you just never shake out um, and so there's this idea roughly that like it's good to try shaking some of that stuff out it's like oh what if you just shook a lot and shook mm-hmm. some of that stuff out and maybe it'd be good um so i one of the things i do excuse me that's more somatic is i just periodically shake mm-hmm. and there's this kind of a, it's not like i'm like articulating the muscles individually myself it's like there's some kind of energy that wants to shake and i can like kind of allow that energy or not and sometimes i like allow it. i'm like okay right now a lot of it's in my shoulders it used mm-hmm. to be more of it was in my back but my shoulders in my head so i can just like do that for a while and uh i'm I, i'm often conflicted like i i often i'm not sure if it's a good thing to do mm. um, or if i'm kind of like doing it right or whatever mm. um, but sometimes it's nice. Sometimes I do it a bunch and then I'm like noticeably less anxious for the rest of the day. So that's mm-hmm. pretty great. I'm like, oh, that's mm-hmm. nice. Sometimes I do it and like some very strong feelings come up and then I can work with those feelings in other ways. Um, sometimes I do it and like some tension releases in other parts of my body, which is nice. I do it mm-hmm. and, like some tension releases in my leg or something. I'm like, oh, that's pretty good. Um, one of the many things that 
learned from trying to deal with like muscle tension type things um, is that like, for whatever reason, like, like I, I, I might have thought initially that I would have to like focus if I have some tension in some specific part of my body, I have to like focus on that part of my body. Um, but mostly I find that I can just kind of like look for hot spots anywhere, just like any way that there's tension, I can like try to release it and then it will help the rest of my body. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I'll release something in my shoulder and it will release something in my, in my calf or something. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know why that's it like that, but I guess it's like that. That's fine. So I'm yeah. kind of used to just kind of like wandering around my body, looking for where the tension is and then occasionally trying to release some of it or wiggling some of it. Mm-hmm. Things like that. Mm-hmm. So that's been really helpful too. Something else that I know you do uh, that I'd be curious to ask you about is, um, you know, I had Mark on the show earlier and we talked about the community that uh, you and I are both in on Slack and, uh, you know, that there's this cultural habit there of sort of having these channels or, or feeds of sort of like journaling out loud about what's on your mind. And I would be curious to hear you describe uh, what that practice has been like for you and, and uh, what's been valuable for you about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been really helpful. Like one thing I've come to realize about myself through not only this Slack, but also through just using Twitter a bunch Mm -hmm. is that like a bunch of my, I'm not quite sure how to say this, but it seems like a bunch of my cognition is tied up with writing. Like Mm. there are some thoughts that like, I don't really have all the way until I've written them down. Yes. Yes. And if I'm, if I'm just kind of like trying to think about stuff in my head or, or, or said them out loud that to ideally to another person, but there are thoughts that kind of just like are, stillborn or something if I just try to have them in my head Mm -hmm. kind of need to involve writing or speaking or something like that to kind of like have all to actually have it to just okay that's a thought that I'm actually having and now I can have another thought along those lines and I have to write it out and uh especially when I'm on acid this is uh (laughs) I don't know if this is something that you want to talk about oh sure yeah um but uh especially when I'm on acid I found that i it's really helpful if I write out literally everything I'm thinking while I'm on acid mm-hmm. because I have a lot of thoughts on acid and it's often overwhelming. Um, and if I don't write them down, then they, they kind of know they kind of get like weird, twisty and loopy or something. But if I write them down, I can like actually have a train of thoughts. Uh, I've and a lot of a lot of good things have happened from me just like just in the Slack channel, just like typing for literally hours mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. on acid. I've done it several times. Every time, it's really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that I can actually like. And I, I, I do little bits of like general focusing and biomotor stuff while I'm doing, like if a feeling arises and I, and I find like a really good description of that feeling, like I'll just type it out. And sometimes that will already be enough to get me to cry. But mm-hmm. it's nice that I don't have to sort of go through the full biomotor process. Like it kind of just happens spontaneously in the middle of this larger, larger conversation. And in fact, one of the times I tried to do this, I ended up, it kind of spontaneously became a dialogue between two of my parts, which was quite mm-hmm. interesting. That was also not something that I planned. It just kind of, I just like started noticing that I was saying things and that I was kept trying to say things from a different perspective, but I was like commenting on the first perspective mm-hmm. and kind of like gently making fun of it uh-huh. <laughs> in like a loving way. And I just like kept doing that and it just kept being this dialogue between this kind of like, um, I'm not sure how to say it, but this sort of like naive part that was like, but what if this other part that's like, ah, it's okay, here's, here's some stuff that you've been lying to yourself about and now you can stop lying to yourself. Like this kind of like more naive part and this kind of like wiser part. Mm-hmm. And it was just very interesting to like, watch those two parts dialogue and just say a bunch of stuff to each other. I was like, oh, this is, this is pretty nice. They like, they like got along. Um, I learned from that experience that being gently made fun of is one of my love languages, apparently. I felt mm. very loved. I felt very loved when that was happening. I was like, mm. oh, oh, you're gently making fun of me. That's so nice. Oh, that's sweet. Huh. <laughs> yeah, that was like really nice. I was like, oh, this is what self-love feels like. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, huh. That was really, that was good. And this was, this was, I think, I may be mixing this up, but this was, where all of the uh, um, the money stuff came from that I wrote mm-hmm. about in the in the money thread, the medium dose of acid thread uh, that got that went viral. Yeah, had various reactions too. But yes, I don't I don't regret it. I'm pretty happy with how that all went down. Uh, I think it, it was good that I did that. Probably I might have been able to do it a little bit more tactfully, but mostly I think it was good. And there's yeah. still a lot. I'm still very confused about money. You know, like there's still a lot more stuff there. But that that thread is actually the reason that I'm here in Seattle. Like. Uh, one of the things, or that acid trip anyway, like one of the things that came up also was that I was, uh, I, I was like, maybe at the time I was living in an Airbnb because I had been kind of kicked out, not exactly kicked out uh, of the group house that I was staying in. And so I was like, living around some Airbnbs. And, I was like, and it came up on the trip 
I was like, what if I moved back home? With my mm. And at the time, the, the part that came like, no, absolutely not. No fucking way. No, I know I say no to a lot of things, but this time I really mean it. Under no circumstances should we ever do. And I, I didn't do anything in response to that. I was just like, okay, I hear you. You really don't want us to move back in with our, my mom. And all I did was hear it out and then I left it. Uh, and then the next day I was like, what if I moved in with my mom? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> like it, it, it had gone from something that was unthinkable to something that was thinkable somehow as a result of that process. And, and that's why I'm here now. Huh. Uh, so that was huh. like another thing that happened as a result of that trip. Yeah. So cool. You had this tweet recently about this, but it seems like there were a number of other uh, positive consequences externally about the thread. Uh, would, yeah. would you mind describing those or summarizing them? Yeah. So the, the first, the, well, a bunch of things happened, but like, the a thing that often happens when I like open up and talk about you know, hard to talk about stuff on Twitter is that people will DM me, not in mm-hmm. replies, but DM me being like, hey, like, man, thank you for writing this. This was like really cool and helpful for me. And like, now I'm thinking about my own feelings. I'm like, yeah, you're mm-hmm. welcome. <laughs> uh, and that happened here. And it happened here in a, in a kind of funny, like, I think literally, literally a dozen people DMs me after that thread to, this was before I closed my DMs Um, because the people were asking me for money yeah Um, but before i closed my dms people dm me being like hey thank you for writing about this i'm kind of in a similar situation where i have all this money and i don't know what to do with it and i Mm -hmm. don't know how to talk about it with anybody because it's not a very like you know because of this like this is the reaction that you get when you talk about having too much money but you don't have to do it people get mad at you and so like i've just been kind of like stewing and i'm like yeah me too i've also just been kind of stewing Mm -hmm. and so they were like thank you for like putting this out there and making me feel like this is like a problem I'm allowed to have a little bit. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. Um, and it's funny because it's the t- the tone of that reaction is the same reaction I get when I talk about like uh, like like romance and sex and stuff. Like I talk, I go like I open up about like oh here are all these feelings I have about my relationships that feel like weird feelings for a dude to have. And I feel kind of embarrassed about them, but I'm still having them though. And then people will DM, dudes will DM me being like, hey, thank you for writing this. Like I feel the same way, and it's just cool to see someone else talk about it. And it's just the same as that. It's mm-hmm. the, the feel, the, the the tone is just the same. It's just like, thank you for talking about this thing. I've never seen anyone talk about it. I don't know how to talk about it. I feel embarrassed about having this about feeling this way but i do feel this way and now i feel a little better about it mm. so that was mm. pretty cool and i was like that was really cool and also it, it like you know i learned something there about like how fucked up people are about money mm. I like, okay yep i kind of knew that abstractly <laughs> but now i know it less abstractly people yes. have a lot of feelings about money uh, and it all i mean it all comes not all but it comes back to this thing I mentioned earlier about like circling showing me that oh people have like beating hearts down mm-hmm. there underneath all the other stuff uh and they have like secret problems and pains that they just mostly never talk about anyone else with and that's mm. terrible and wouldn't it be great if we could talk about some of that stuff and this felt like a sort of another opening up like another whole aspect of that you know like i already knew that people had that kind of stuff around romance and sex but it was like uh money that's like mm. another another part of the like cultural shadow of- mm. It was cool to get to see that. Uh, also, several people got in touch with me that I hadn't gotten in touch with for a while. So another thing that happened as a result of that thread was that, like, you know, a lot of people heard about it, <laughs> and mm-hmm. some of those people were people who knew me already, and some of them contacted me. Um, so like, there was a so I very briefly was an MIT admissions blogger, mm-hmm. and there was an MIT admissions blogger group chat that mm-hmm. I was briefly invited to. And they were like, hey, thank you. We looked, we saw your thread and it prompted a really good discussion about like our money situations and how we and our ways in which that we feel uncomfortable about mm. our money and like what we can do with that. So like thank you for prompting mm. this really cool discussion. So that was like another thing that happened. And mm. probably that had effects that I will never know about. But, sure. Uh, but it's cool that, that happened. Uh, also I love those my- second order <laughs> effects so much. Yeah, yeah sure also my best friend in college reached out to me like i hadn't i hadn't talked to her in ages and she mm. just like got to catch up a little mm. and i got to hear about her kids which was amazing mm. like it seems like she's having a good time with the kids and that was just like really nice to get to catch up with her mm. um, and i didn't expect that to last i was like you know eventually i'm just gonna be busy with stuff or whatever but it was just really nice to get to have that. oh and she was also very supportive of that she was like this is great i'm really clappy like 
I'm really happy you're talking about this. It's like really cool. Like it's mm. really cool to see the kind of stuff you've been up to. So that was just like a really nice little moment of connection with an old friend there. That was mm. really cool. Mm. Uh, you mentioned like as well that you might have been more tactful if you did it differently now. Like what would you, how would you phrase it differently or write it differently if, if you had the chance? Well, I think in retrospect, it's it's a little hard to be too confident sure these things but i think like there is this kind of mischievous troll side of me that comes out every once in a while mm -hmm. and uh and i think that part of me deliberately wrote the first tweet to be like provocative mm -hmm. um and i think it did too good of a job it's more provocative <laughs> than i wanted <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and i think I'm, I'm not sure exactly what i would have done differently but if i had split that if i if i had split the first tweet up into two parts or if i had just not mentioned how much money it was that mm -hmm. that's maybe the simplest fix if i had just said a lot of money mm -hmm. but that felt that felt like um what's the word like really disingenuous in an important way like it's important to the story to know how much money it was because mm -hmm. if it was like a thousand dollars then like sure whatever but like it was important it was like a paralyzingly large amount of money like mm -hmm. A, a con it was like a confusingly large amount of money like i did mm. if it had been ten thousand, even i would have been like okay well that's like nice mm -hmm. but a hundred thousand was like oh that's like oh, that's like several I, that's like i don't have to work for several years mm. that's like crazy um or it's like oh i could like invest that and if i get lucky i could turn that into enough it's not enough money to retire the part of mm. part of what's annoying about it is that it's not enough money to retire on um, but it is enough money to like make significant investments mm -hmm. And maybe if I get really lucky, I could invest it in some way, which will turn it into enough to return. So that that's like a weird amount of money to have because now I have to think about the possibility. Like mm. what I, I didn't mention any of this because this was there's just too much other stuff already. But it was like it was like an amount of money I had to manage, you know, mm. or else mm -hmm. I had to like feel like I was wasting it. Like this mm. is something I feel like people really didn't understand. Like a lot of people were like, well, if you don't if you're so upset about having the money why don't just give it away and it's like because then i can't use it for anything else that's mm. why like it's an opportunity cost if i gave all that money to charity that means i couldn't use it to start a company that means i couldn't use it to like you know afford to not work for a while so i can like fuck around and do a bunch of interesting projects that means i don't use it to like you know turn into a larger you know invest into a larger pile of money that i used to retire or that i used to like have a family or that i used to buy you know like there's all this other stuff and if i give it away to charity then i can't do any of that stuff um, and it's just and I, I still don't know how to relate to that like, there's still mm -hmm. just like a there's so many possibilities and i don't know how to think about that at all mm -hmm. still you know that's mm -hmm. still happening um but I felt like it was something people didn't really get about the situation, that there was this, everything, every idea that they had about what to do with that, with that money carries an opportunity cost, which is that I can't do any of the other things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, part, part of the reason to ask is less like, oh, you should have done it differently, chow chew, you idiot. Yeah. It's like, what did you learn about speech on the internet that will inform how you go about speech on the internet in the future, if that makes yeah. sense? Yeah, 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 so like, one thing that is genuinely unfortunate is like there are obviously there are lots of people on the internet and in the world who mm -hmm. are really struggling financially who are like you know doing things like putting up gofundmes and stuff and just like barely scraping by mm -hmm. and i wish those people had not seen my thread mm -hmm. like the way in which it went viral caused a bunch of people to see it who really did not need to see it and they reacted to that threat as if I had written it at them, mm. which I did not. Mm. Um, I d in a perfect world, that thread would have only reached the kinds of people who DM'd me who were like, oh, yeah, mm. I'm in this situation and it's fucked up and I don't know how to talk about it. Like, that would have been ideal. And unfortunately, that's not how Twitter works. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, in order for this thread to have the kind of reach that it had, uh, had to hit both groups. It had to hit, yeah. And it was, that's, that was regrettable. And I wish I could have done something about that. Or if I had anticipated it, maybe I would have written, said something about that somewhere in the thread, been like, by the way, there are a bunch of people who have the mm. exact opposite problem. I recognize that those people do not need to read this thread. This thread is mm. not for them. I am sorry if you see this thread and you're mm. like, your dying mother like can't pay her medical bills. Like, I'm so sorry. Um, like that's, you're just having the opposite problem that I'm having. Mm. Yeah. So that was truly unfortunate. But I also don't, I don't feel like I can take that much responsibility for that happening because I'm not the one who made it go viral. Mm -hmm. I'm not the one who, 
I'm not the New York Times reporter who quote tweeted me. <laughs> There's literally a New York Times reporter who just like dunked on me. I was like, is this really uh-huh. your best use of your fucking time? Uh-huh. <laughs> like, come on, Jesus. Uh-huh. You know, like I didn't do that. Uh, so like, I, I like kind of want that whole, I mean, it's kind of hard because it's not, obviously not one person, but like that whole dynamic on Twitter where like something like, oh, this is the person we're gonna make fun of today. And mm. we're gonna like, signal boost them a lot it just it has a lot of a lot of weird effects yeah uh, like the main character being the main character yeah, being for the, the day main character yeah yeah uh, and there's like like if if i had maybe just not mentioned the amount nothing else it probably wouldn't have gone viral as my guess yeah i mean that's that's maybe the complexity of it is like it wouldn't have reached the people that it benefited yeah. it also wouldn't have reached I, people that it might have triggered yeah. or hurt and but i do think that like the amount was impo- like the amount was important for understanding why i was so confused mm-hmm. about it it's like mm-hmm. this is it's a confusing amount of money to think about uh, what about and feel free to not answer this but what about your parents has that shifted your relationship with your parents at all yeah so they both read it mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and i had conversations with both of them about it yeah and i had a really good conversation with my dad about it actually like i opened up to him a lot and of course, I was like, you should know that I'm like very angry at you at all for all of these reasons. And like, I don't know how to talk to you about anything. And he mm-hmm. like said really nice things in response to that. And that was that was cool. So like mm-hmm. something like changed for the better in my relationship with my dad. I had a conversation with my mom about it, which was like kind of more disappointing, mm-hmm. um, but which was relevant to me moving back here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I still don't really know how to talk to my mom about anything, but like it was like the beginning of something maybe just kind of nice. Do you have any advice for friends or hypothetical people, <laughs> theoretical people that might want to talk to their parents about uncomfortable things who might theoretically exist? Uh, I have reader. No. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have any useful advice. Like I, I, I'm frustrated by this sense that it's something I'm probably going to do sooner or later. I'm like, I'm pretty sure it would be really good for everybody involved if I learned how to talk to my parents mm. but i still feel so much resistance to it i'm still just like no no mm, no, me no. Too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i i do love the phrase you said though of like i'm feeling a lot of angry anger at you and i don't know how to talk to you about it like i feel like i could say that there's like stuff i want to oh. talk to you about that i don't know how to talk to you about and, and not even say what it is and just yeah. see what they yeah. do with that ball in their court that could be that could be a thing yeah yeah i i i i i have a guess that what it's going to take for me is to like really listen to the part of me that's objecting so strongly like you know I feel very strongly they're trying to defend some kind of value like they're kind of my my sense of it so far is that like they feel like it would be some kind of betrayal of my child self Mm. if I like they being the part of you not your parents yeah 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 that that part of me that's objecting feels like it would be some kind of betrayal mm. of myself if I want to talk to them. I'm like, and if I like really listened to that part and like tried to get it to dialogue with other parts, I think something would happen, but I have not done that yet because <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel you, my friend. I feel you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm scared thinking about it. I, yeah. I, I realized that part of the background assumption of me having this question for you is like the assumption that we're you know two hours deep into a conversation that my parents probably will listen to <laughs> you know like maybe they will if if they are mom dad i love you we can have these conversations i'll still love you uh i just don't know how to talk to you about it about things you know oh, man. but uh oh, but i'm like ooh, I, you know security by obscurity basically <laughs> yeah, i mean it's funny so um I don't know if you're familiar with like landmark forms. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, I think like you mentioned this last time we talked about it, but uh, oh yeah, feel, so yeah, I, feel free to go. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say, sort of, at least for the benefit of anyone who might be listening. Yes, like, please. One of their big things is that they like tell you to talk to your parents. Yes. <laughs> at least I heard this is secondhand. But there's like, what if you talked to your parents though? What if it were good? <laughs> yeah. And like, that's kind of nice. You know, it's kind of nice that there's some big organization that's like, okay, but like, what if you talked to your parents? Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, I'm still just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> hey, me too, man. <laughs> but this is just the no, no, no show. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think I think it'll I think it'll get better probably. Yeah. 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 I want to come back to this uh, sort of journaling skill that you do in the Slack and also on Twitter and certainly other people do it as well. But I want to ask you in particular about like, um, you know, you said it's valuable just to like 
write down what your thoughts are and that is verbal, but, but what would you say is sort of the impact of it being social that, you know, people can read what you write and interact with it, reply to it, yeah. et cetera. What, what's that been like for you? So on, on the Slack specifically, it's really nice because there's like emoji reacts, which mm. I actually think are an amazing piece of technology. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's not exactly a substitute for having like a real person live listening mm -hmm. to you and responding, but it's very like, I really like getting emoji reacts. Yeah, yeah. It's I had great. this tweet recently about this of like react game is a form of reply game. I, yeah, I think yeah. that was based on our conversations about yeah, it. Like, this, like, really I, powerful. Try, I try, I try to react a lot to other people's yes. messages for this reason. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's really nice to get, we have like the, like the, the Facebook, like hug react mm -hmm. and we have the like, we have like sad reacts and we have like oh. hearts and all sorts of stuff. And I just think this is like actually a very rich language of like getting to see how the stuff that, that I write or that other people are just impacting other people. Like, I think it's really cool. And I, I really, it like, it makes a big, like it, it, it feels lonely when I like write a ton of stuff in the Slack and they just don't get any kind of response. Mm. But even getting a single react is like hugely better than nothing. It's like so much better. It's like, oh, somebody was like touched mm. by this or like somebody feels sad on my behalf or like somebody like feels like, like, um, like uh, protective or something like that feels like so nice. And then people sometimes say stuff and they're like, oh my God, like, oh, like, oh, they're like, oh, like, oh, I feel this way too sometimes. Or like, oh, I just like feel so touched about this. Like I, um, when I was like writing a lot of stuff with my parents about how I felt about my parents, like uh, like another person in the Slack who is also Chinese, like wrote about how they felt about it. They were like, oh, it's just like, I wish that like you could, I wish that you could see like how much you really like feel how much your parents have been like caring about you. Mm -hmm. And like, that would be such like, I just, that would be like such a, I just like really want you to have the experience. Like, oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It was, and it was, it was especially, powerful to hear that from another Chinese person and be like oh yeah you know it <laughs> yeah it's it's different it's it's a whole thing with Chinese parents and it's it means it means something a little extra to to hear that coming from someone else who's who's been there mm -hmm. but, totally yeah, big thing. totally I, I also quite like compared to like talking to a friend about stuff one of the things I really like about just typing in this in this channel mm -hmm. um, is that I don't feel like I'm making any specific demands on any specific other person's time mm -hmm. um, like i have uh a lot of trouble asking for help and so it's nice to not have to do it <laughs> mm -hmm. totally <laughs> and it's, it's nice to be like oh other people can respond if they want to and they mm -hmm. don't and if they don't want to they don't have to respond and in fact if they don't want to hear this they don't have to be in my feed channel and it's nice that like it's very it feels very like opt-in on the other side mm -hmm. um, and that i don't have to make any requests <laughs> yeah great. yeah that happens to be like I, this twitter is kind of similar it's like nice to be able to get responses from people on twitter without feeling like i'm asking any particular other person to respond that mm -hmm. that's really nice i really appreciate that what's sort of the the feeling tone for you of being in the slack in the intimate private setting versus being on twitter and po posting there it's like it's nice because I feel I, I get to the people on that Slack have like a lot of shared context about like weird spiritual things or just like weird feelings. And I feel like for me, there's this overall, overall feeling that like we know what it's like to have all sorts of weird emotional stuff and weird psychological mm. stuff, spiritual stuff. And we're all like pretty willing to accept that in other people. Mm -hmm. And so if you go in there being like, oh yeah, today I had like, you know, extensive fantasies about killing myself or whatever they're just like yeah that happens sometimes yeah. how was that for you <laughs> like uh, what can we really do nice yeah. to be in an environment where that stuff is just kind of everyone knows that that's a kind of thing that happens to people yeah it's just like yeah that happened to you how people was that? have suicidal thoughts sometimes yeah that yeah. is like a thing it doesn't mean you're going to kill yourself it doesn't mean you're in any imminent danger but like what did it mean you know mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that kind of openness to the kinds of experiences that i in fact have that's like great i mm -hmm. really appreciate that and i imagine other people do too whereas yeah. on twitter i had to be very guarded about it. at least on my on my on my main i had to be like very guarded about a bunch of things mm -hmm. um, because a bunch of things i think people just don't have quite enough context to appreciate or it, like and i can't introduce enough context in tweets to do that and yes. like, people are gonna not understand it. they're gonna say dumb shit and I just, it's just very annoying and frustrating. Mm. And it's nice to not have to do that. Um, like, yeah, there's just, 
my Twitter experience has really degraded as I've gotten more followers, which I regret. I wish it wasn't like that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like the replies just get worse and worse. And yeah, yeah I, I, I could, use, I have a locked alt, which I could start using more, um, mm-hmm. but I kind of find that, that the Slack is, I, all the stuff I would have put on there, I put on Slack now, so. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing that I found really valuable with this sort of thing as well as like, whether it's alts or, the, you know, the Slack or similar things is like that it, well, one, it's asynchronous, but two, it also scales. Like mm-hmm. I can have the same conversation with many people and they know like, oh, this is what it's been like for Tasha. And then that's like in shared awareness such that if I pick up the phone to a friend, like they already know, oh yeah, that's what happened this week for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool to have like, uh, yeah, it's just like a lot of context. Like, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, like my friend X from the suck. I like know what's been going on. I like know <laughs> some of the emotional rhythms that have been going on in their life because I just get to hear about it. Yeah, totally. It's really nice. I do like that. Totally. Um, you actually popped in the Slack recently about uh, your, there's like a document that you started writing or at least exploring writing about yeah. uh, you. I think you called it like meta therapy. Could you talk about what yeah. you mean by that? So it's, it's, it's a thing I, I got excited about with Malcolm, mm-hmm. I think starting right after the biomotive workshop like i it gave me the biomotive workshop gave me a lot of thoughts about like uh so i know a lot of people who are like really into into like therapy techniques as like mm-hmm. a thing like they go around two different workshops to collect different yeah. techniques and there's like a bunch of them you know there's like ifs and there's like core transformation which i have done very little there's like uh you know rpf that i do with parent stuff there's like variations of cbt cognitive behavioral therapy there's like more trauma focused things there's like more, you know there's a whole there's like more somatic things there's like a whole universe of these mm-hmm. techniques out there and i have actually quite a lot of friends at this point like maybe in the dozens who like collect these things you know, yeah and like yeah, mix yeah. and match them and it's like okay which which oh. of the various oh. things i do should i be doing right now in this thing and like what if i combined these two things and what if i like kind of made up my own thing that is inspired by this other thing that i heard about but it's like a little bit different and i think that's really cool that's like really mm-hmm. cool and exciting to me like and some of these people are literally coaches you know some of them like that's what they do and yeah. some of them others are just like they're just like have a lot of problems and they need mm. and they just need a lot of to do to work on them a lot on their own mm. um, and i think it's cool and there's sort of no nobody has really talked about that thing the thing where we're like taking from a bunch of other people's schools of thought and techniques and stuff and kind of like doing a I think one of one of one of my friends once described it as an MMA of self-development mm. oh um, yeah oh that's such a good metaphor a fun for, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, that's a great phrase I really <laughs> yeah. I really like that and like so that thing that we we're that a bunch of people I know are doing I was like wouldn't it be great if we mm. talked about that mm-hmm. um, so Malcolm and I talked about it a little bit gave it a name that name was meta therapy and mm-hmm. the, the meta bit is to emphasize that it's not like a specific approach to therapy. You know, there are many specific approaches to therapy, but the, but as a as a as a as a consumer of those approaches, you know, there are, there are questions. They're like, which one's good? Mm. Which ones should I look to at any given time? You know, like how can we sort of take the best? Like, what insights do each does each approach have that other approaches don't have? Like, how can we sort of like coalesce all of them into like a big blob of therapy that we mm-hmm. can do to people? And then that'd be great if we like you know, had some good thoughts about that. So, so I started having some thoughts about that a while ago and didn't really do anything with them. And recently I woke up and suddenly was like, I feel like writing a book, uh-huh. <laughs> which I knew would not last. I was like, this uh-huh. feeling will not last. And I was right. It did not, last. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at least for the day I had that feeling. I was like, I'm going to write a book about meta therapy mm-hmm. and just like lay out what I actually think about it. And the outline is it terrific. Thank you. Yeah. And it just, it, it was, it was, uh, if nothing else, it was a good opportunity for me to organize all my thoughts about the subject. Mm-hmm. Uh, like like in the in that line i i have like a section that's just like a glossary kind of just mm-hmm. like here are like 20 concepts that i think are important and now just writing that out was really helpful and interesting so wow yeah there's a lot of concepts i really use a lot of concepts when i think about this stuff there's like oh i don't even remember anymore but there's like trauma and like attachment and like uh like layering which is for which is for mark stuff and just like I, I, there's really like a at this point, like a very large conceptual apparatus that I that I use. Mm-hmm. And it was nice to get to have all that stuff just written down all at once. So I could kind of like start noticing what I was unsatisfied about with it. And I did notice a lot of things I was unsatisfied about. There was, there's something, I, I have the sense that the whole thing could be like a lot more unified. That there could be 
not exactly like a grand unified theory, but like something 10% more in that direction than what I currently had. The thing that I currently have feels like a kind of jumble of different concepts and models. And I'm like, I think this could be less of a jump. I think there's, there could be more of a unification here. And that was cool, but I also haven't really gone back to it since. I've just been kind of thinking about it in the back of my head, just like, what, what would it be if it was like a grand unified thing? Part of, part of what, um, part of what's, why I haven't done this kind of thing sooner is that I've just like, I feel like I've hit a, a big block personally, mm. uh, where I'm just like feeling stuck and don't know what to do. And when I feel that way, it's like, okay, obviously I'm missing something really important or like not obviously, but I think the reason that I'm stuck is that I'm missing something really important. To me. And as long as I am missing that thing, like I won't be able to write about it because I don't know what it is yet. And so any document that I write will also necessarily be missing something really important. Um, which, you know, I would prefer it not be that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would rather write something that feels uh, like it has, if not everything, like a seed that can grow into everything. Like mm -hmm. the sort of the minimum apparatus that is capable of like taking in new information and sort of getting everything else from, mm -hmm. from that thing, which is, I think, similar to what Mark is trying to do. Mm. Uh, part, of, part of this is, part, part of, part, another reason that it's tricky to write this is because I, I think, I think like why it, maybe I should just link people to Mark's document because it's really mm. good. I really like Mark's stuff. Like, I, I sense I that like I, I've gotten a lot of value out of um, that book and from talking to him. And uh, also, I, I believe it's catered to a an audience that like you would fit in more than I would. And like, there's a lot of stuff that I don't understand in there and don't know how to yeah. make use of. And part yeah. of the reason I'm excited about what is in your outline is like I imagine you'd be able to explain some of those concepts in a way that would be relatable to me. Like, you know, just for example, I was, I mean, I have some background in math actually, but like I was, I was comprehending the things you were saying about math really. Like you can, you can explain it in an intelligible way. And actually Mark yeah. can do that too, but that's not what he's trying to do with that document, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's some, there's some stuff in there that, I mean, there's plenty of stuff in there that I don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. like he uses occasionally some very technical metaphors. Sure. It's interesting. I like but even the sense that there's content there. You know? Uh, but even the set of things that you like listed, the ones of those that come to Mark, like fr from Mark's document, I mean, like are um, the ones of them that I have been exposed to and been like, oh yeah, I kind of have a sense of that. That's like, those have been really valuable. And then the ones mm -hmm. that I haven't, like there's already, there's already a superset basically of yeah, yeah. things that you understand and are, are able to digest. So anyway, that's where part of where the excitement is coming from. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think it's, and this is something that I think Mark says in the protocol, it's like, it would be cool if you rewrote this document in your mm -hmm. own words. <laughs> uh -huh. That would yeah, be yeah. like a cool thing to do. And so even if this just ends up being me rewriting the protocol doc in my own words, I think that would still be a very valuable exercise. Uh, Absolutely. For me and probably for other people just to get to, to, get to hear someone else's very different take. On totally. Uh, do you have a sense of um, what that block or hole in your experience or model of these things is that you are kind of chewing on in the background? yeah so it might be the power of friendship <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well like glad I, we're here <laughs> and it's and it's kind of tied up in actually the whole framing of the document like the the meta therapy document is sort of fundamentally solo mm -hmm. as a thing like part of part of the thing is like when i say this in the introduction i was like one of the reasons you might want to do this kind of thing is because you don't trust therapists mm -hmm. <laughs> or like you generally maybe don't trust other people to help you and so you mm -hmm. feel like you have to figure stuff out on your own and this is document that can help you figure stuff out on your own um but it definitely plays into like my existing tendencies to like not ask for help and try to like do everything by myself and uh so you know outside view one of the things i'm probably missing involves asking people for help and like mm -hmm. learning to rely on my friends mm -hmm. i don't really know how to do that it seems very scary mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And so I'm still just kind of like chugging along, trying to do things by myself. But like, there's I'm very limited in what I can do by myself by my mm -hmm. own energy mm -hmm. levels and depression kinds of things. And mm -hmm. so like, yeah, there could be there could be something really. And I do I mean I do make, like later in the document there's like a list of like moves like there are some things you could try doing as you're sort of running the meta therapy loop. And one of them is like, ask a friend for help. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I hear that's a good idea. It's like, oh, it's on my list. Oh, but I don't uh -huh. want to do it. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's tricky. Uh, oh man, I'm going to put you on the spot here. 
and yeah. you can you can handle it how you want to of course but mm -hmm. i'm going to dare you to try yeah. to ask me for help oh no ah. part of okay so part of the issue is that, that like i feel like my ass my my requests sort of necessarily have to be very vague mm. like anything i really need help on part of the issue is that i don't know what's going on mm. and i don't know what kind of help would make sense mm. so like you know mm -hmm. uh so oh well that's helpful because i've already had at least three ideas for your book so uh, <laughs> i can send those to you afterwards cool yeah yeah but it's not really the book that i need help on i need help with my like, life you know oh my yeah that's pretty bad the right life now. yeah so i guess i can describe to you what's going on with my life uh-huh okay Maybe, and if you wanted to think about how to help with that that would be nice it's just like uh i don't know i guess the central thing is there's sort of two central things that are related one is like i don't know how to make money and mm. doing a thing that's satisfying and then the related thing is like i don't know who my people are like, mm. who, like where to find like an like an in-person community of people that i can really get along with and like do cool stuff with um and those feel sort of frustratingly tied to each other because you know like if i had a job that i liked maybe my coworkers could be those people Mm. or if i was in like a really cool community of people that i got along with maybe i could make money by collaborating with those people in some way mm. you know? so mm. there, it feels to me like there's a bit of a catch-22 structure here where i don't know how to get either of these things without the other mm. uh, and so that's like rough like mm. possibly the community is actually more important than the money because i don't need money personally mm -hmm but I am kind of like languishing in social isolation. And I have been since the beginning of lockdown. Like I just haven't really known. I have specifically uh, in-person community. Yeah. Like I don't yeah. really, uh, I mean, it's not talking to people is not, I, I think I usually, uh, I'm usually surprised by how nice it is to talk to people on, mm -hmm. on, over video and stuff. Like I assume that I won't get much out of it. It's usually pretty nice. Uh, but I do think it would be, it would be great to have some IRL community again. Mm -hmm. Like I remember what that was like and it was great. So, mm -hmm. And I don't know how to get it again. Like, I don't know where people are. I don't know where I want to be. It's like a whole mess. It seems mm -hmm. very complicated, confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's like, that's like some stuff that's going on. Like I, there's a way that I feel kind of like dead and I'm by myself, like various parts of me are kind of dead and I'm by myself and I don't really know how to like, uh, there's a kind of like flow of the world that I can feel like I'm in when I'm like around an active community of people who are like doing stuff, like you know, things kind of like happen every day. Like I wake up and like, there's this kind of sense of we're kind of on some adventure together. Mm and feels like things are moving and when i'm alone like things don't feel like, like they're moving they feel like they're stagnant mm. and like it would be mm. nice to feel more like i was in the universe again i can mm. sort of get this from twitter actually sometimes on a, on a good day twitter mm -hmm. can feel like this, but it's not very reliable sure yeah i think there was a day over the summer where i messaged you i was like twitter is on <laughs> feels really alive and intimate right now and we were, yeah. it was like we looked at each other like yeah definitely yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. you remember that I, I remember I remember that yeah yeah I don't remember exactly what was happening yeah I, I don't either it was but like, oh there was a it day was where Twitter was just like really nice <laughs> really nice yeah. yeah uh yeah the main thing that comes to mind is like um I, I've got this is this feels so paltry and unhelpful but like is like trying things that are easy to do and are relatively safe to fail of like I don't know for example I'm, I'm reminding that you you uh, liked Austin and I, I was just in Austin a couple months ago and I liked Austin as well and like I don't know it, it, I imagine I don't know but, but like that it would be relatively easy to like go there for like two weeks and get an Airbnb and like see how that goes Ooh, Ooh. maybe uh -huh. oh it's everything <sighs> or somewhere else it doesn't it wouldn't have to be Austin yeah. in particular but something like that it's strange I mean in some sense it, in some sense it would be easy to do Mm -hmm. but like it feels like a big deal to me somehow like mm -hmm. even even just for two week visit feels like a big deal to me somehow. Mm -hmm. and i don't really know how to cash that out i don't know what it is but just like seems like a really large move somehow mm -hmm. and i'm just like oh it feels would a weekend feel big 
it's the flying that the flying yeah, i don't yeah, know yeah. why it feels uh -huh. because i mean it makes sense fact, it's not that big of a deal like i have in fact many times you know booked airplane tickets and <laughs> to the airports and stuff but I don't, I don't know what it is about it that feels like a big deal i think i don't know i could speculate i think there are parts of me that are conf still confused about lockdown like is lockdown open mm -hmm. is it safe to travel like i don't i don't get it like i'm, I'm still confused you know mm -hmm. new variant there's new variant now i don't know what to do with that i guess i should get a booster <laughs> like, mm -hmm. but like is it safe to travel is now a good time to travel is it unusually good time to travel before it hits or should i just wait mm -hmm. like lots of other people are going to be traveling it's the holidays it's that good? And i i have a very i have a a, a p100 that i wore that to on the flight here mm -hmm. So I, I'm probably not in that much danger, but it just feels like I just, you know, these are the considerations that come up. It's like, okay, but if I were to fly to Austin, then I would have to think about how safe is the airport right now? Like, I don't know. Mm. Seems mm. uncertain. And like that, just hitting that wall of uncertainty is already, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. <laughs> mm. That's already enough to get me to not do it, at least for the time, like, you know, in the absence of like um, external motivation or some kind. I don't know. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's just such a pain in the ass to think about. Think what about is it. what is the uncertainty like? What is, how do you experience that in your body and your mind? Fair. Oh, I don't know. There's like a vague tension in my what is solar plexus, maybe mm -hmm. a bit lower. Uh, like right at the bottom of my ribs here. Mm -hmm. And in my shoulders, uh, like feeling a little more like this, mm -hmm. contracting. Mm. Uh, it just feels big. It's like. What's the most unpleasant part of it? Not, I'm not sure how to answer that it's just mm -hmm. like i was gonna say overwhelming but it's something more specific than overwhelming it's like it feels like an adult decision and mm. i don't feel like an adult right now mm. i guess you could say it's like oh that's like someone adult should make that decision i'm just a kid i don't know mm. how to do anything mm. <laughs> that's how it feels yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah so that's in there mm -hmm. i don't understand how to make trade-offs in general like oh yeah i have relatable very yeah. relatable my friend there's like a you know there's like a okay there's like a some kind of there's some kind of like very some kind of hard to quantify code risk and then on the other hand you know i could go to a place where it's like nice and sunny mm -hmm. and friendly and where i know some cool people and maybe we could hang out and uh I just don't know how to weigh those things at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just, I have no idea. Well, when you put it like that, it sounds pretty clear. But you know, I'm also not you, and uh, yeah, it's not easy. It actually isn't easy. So, yeah. But uh, the outside perspective over here is book a flight to Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's just good. me. That could be good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Sure. Mm. Well, thanks for uh, playing along. I sort of put you on the spot there. So yeah, yeah, no, it was it was a nice. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hmm. One other thing I wanted to make sure to talk about um, that we've talked about a fair bit is uh, is theory of mind. Uh, oh, mm, yeah. yeah. Do you have anything to say about theory of mind just to get us started? <laughs> so I assume this is uh, we had some kind of short exchange on Twitter where I said something like I think most people. Like someone, I don't remember exactly. This might have been responding to something that Visa said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like unsatisfied about something about his replies, and I was like, I think most people on Twitter don't have theory of mind in any yeah. real way. Uh -huh. <laughs> he was like saying something about being frustrated about being misunderstood. I think mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. along those lines. And I was like, Yeah, I just don't. I kind of don't think people have Twitter theory of mind. <laughs> yeah, it's rough, man. Yeah. What was what was sort of, uh, and I asked you this, but just to. Kind of go over it again and have it be on record like what was mm -hmm. sort of i i completely agree i was like yes <laughs> people theory of mind not so great including me including me i wish my own theory of mind were better sure, i've like yeah. worked on it but like mm -hmm. still more to grow uh 
but like what what makes that if that is in fact like the the status quo what in your view why did you come to see that being the status quo what do you think is responsible for that mm. i mean on twitter specifically it really doesn't help that everything's happening through text like, mm, of course i don't know yeah. if this was the same conversation but someone else brought up and this is possibly also visa that like when people read tweets they're reading them in their own voices it's mm. like they can't hear your voice because it's not there and he's been saying stuff about how he thinks this kind of misunderstanding is actually much it's much better on youtube where you can like see someone's face yes their voice and be like oh that's like a person it's another person who's not me mm -hmm. <laughs> whereas i think on on twitter it's it's easy to kind of like it's i think it's really easy in to, to project stuff on people's tweets because mm -hmm. you're not hearing their voice and you're not seeing their face and it's just like a bunch of words and there's also this funny thing i feel like on twitter and i like i wouldn't say this is true on facebook for example i think on twitter specifically twitter somehow incentivizes a writing style where you kind of like write as if you're kind of like writing your internal monologue mm. and other people i think and the effect that has on, on readers i think is, is other people interpret your tweets as if they were part of their internal monologue mm. and that's that kind of cool like there's cool stuff you can do with that but it's also mm. kind of terrifying <laughs> and like it really does not help people remember that there are like other people at the end of Twitter, you know, mm. it, all, it can all become very much like everything is just part of your psychodrama. And like, there are, there are people on Twitter, I claim that once you start asking yourself, like, are all of these tweets just this person tweeting at themselves? And you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> pretty much. It's just, mm -hmm. even when they're replying to other people, they're still pretty much just tweeting at themselves. And that's not necessarily bad. It's like, I think there's a lot of things people need to say to themselves. There's just like a lot of self-dialogue maybe that needs to happen. But it is a little, like, it's a little unfortunate that other people have to get involved in that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's Twitter specifically. And then I think in general, it's just like, if you are around people who don't know how to talk about what's actually going on for them, you know, who, are, who don't know how to like open up about what's, what their lives are actually like, and you're just around people who kind of like cover that stuff up with various kinds of defenses or whatever, then you end up with a very, like if you never see past, if you never get a chance to see past that, you end up with a very weird view of human nature. Mm -hmm. Like you just assume that that stuff is what's, is all that there is. Or maybe you feel like I have feelings, I know what it's like for me. Like I have all sorts of stuff going on. Everyone else though is like terrible. <laughs> mm. And if that's the way you feel, like I don't think many people would be willing to say that out loud, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people secretly feel that way on some level. They're just like, I've never really seen someone else open up. And so everyone else just seems kind of terrible to them. Mm. Um, that's like a really shitty place to be. It's like a really shitty, lonely place to be. And it means they don't really understand the people around them. Like mm. they're just like, don't really get that other people around them are like you know hurting in various ways and like constantly they don't get that people around them like have all sorts of all sorts of problems all sorts of problems that they're not talking about it's just like fucking crazy uh, and if you don't know that about the people around you then it's just it's just hard to understand them it's hard to understand why people do the things they do mm -hmm. i think that's sort of that's like a more giant problem that's not specific to twitter mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's, it seemed to me like there's sort of a developmental thing too of like you're at certain stages of development you're not able to yeah like empathize with other people yeah, because you're just yeah, yeah, everything yeah. is your experience yeah. yeah 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 for sure and like i think there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff like that i think just like developmental things that just don't really happen for a lot of people and we mm -hmm. all claim that they happen but it's like but if you really look it's, mm -hmm. it's unclear man it's mm -hmm. unclear <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, I don't think I had the capacity to really empathize with people until I started circling. Uh -huh. And that happened when I was like 26, you know? Yeah. I think I'm, I'm not sure I really could empathize with people yes. before that. Yeah. I think it was circling for me as well that shifted it for me. Yeah, it's like, holy crap, other people <laughs> really exist. <laughs> they, have, they really have experiences that are different from mine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I can understand them. And yeah, it's, it's like wild. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 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 What do you think it is about? I mean, this might be like stating the obvious, but like, what do you think it is about circling that makes it such a potent tool for like unlocking theory of mind? 
there's like like you for me it was like i got to see the way in which other people were just like me mm. that like oh like all of these like secret hidden fears and longings like i got to see that in other people reflected in other people it was like that was i was like whoa you're just like me in that way like oh you also experience heartbreak oh you also feel sad when people abandon you like oh mm. that's like this is some universal human shit we're on here but i just like didn't i hadn't seen it yeah I didn't, I didn't really, but then i got to see it i was like oh you too experience these universal human experience human mm -hmm. emotions that people such as myself experience mm. And that really, that like really drove it home. I was like, oh yeah, you, everyone, you're just people like me. Just mm. not, we're just not that different mm. down here in the squishy bit. The squishy bits are really remarkably similar across people. Like I, one of the things I really like about, uh, like when I do coaching, which is not that often, you know, like I make people cry for money. Mm. And one of the things I really like about the, the kind of opening up that I encourage people to do they like really just like talk about the stuff that makes them want to cry is that like like it's so it's so like so much the same across people like there just aren't that many emotions <laughs> mm. uh, like i really get like a visceral sense of like shared humanity when people are crying and just talking about why they're sad and grieving just like there just aren't that many different themes there's like a it's like it all feels like very universal just like ah oh, yeah we're all just mm -hmm. together we're all just trying to get by uh -huh. the best we can that's right that's, <laughs> that's great like that's compassion great. comes out of that yeah. yeah it feels much like circling was probably the first time i've probably one of the first times i felt like genuine compassion i was like mm -hmm. wow i that that's what this is this is compassion holy crap <laughs> yeah. like, it's totally i think there's I, I don't know i've been chewing on this for a while but i think there's like an interesting relationship between theory of mind and compassion and the Brahma Vihara is more generally loving kindness, sympathetic joy and equanimity, where it's like theory of mind isn't the same as compassion. It's not the same as sympathetic joy. It's not the same as feeling love for someone else. It's certainly not the same as equanimity, but it's like mm -hmm. meaningfully related where like yeah. the more you feel those things, the easier it is to have theory of mind, the more theory of mind, the easier it is to feel the other things. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. like, it's it's hard to feel loving kindness if you like secretly feel like you're the only real human and everyone else is this like are these like cold and human robots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so once and, but once you see other people just being really really human you're like oh i live in a world of humans <laughs> like, yeah yeah that's yeah. crazy i can love them oh they can love me oh that's that's nuts <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it's hard to it, it, like riffing on that it's like hard to have compassion for someone else too in a meaningfully different situation if you can't like imagine what it would be like to be them yeah. if you just yeah. think that they're the same as you then you can't understand what's meaningfully different about their situation yeah, yeah. visa yeah. says something interesting related to this also which i don't remember the original context but he said something like a lot of his favorite people read a lot of fiction when they were mm. kids and i do think there's something about that that like makes it a little, maybe a little easier to step in someone else's shoes yes once you sort of get to the point where you can kind of like see the story of someone else's life like oh here's your story and it's like not my story at all but like i can feel the emotional beats of the story of your life mm -hmm. now that you've told it to me and i can like imagine what it would be like in the same way that i imagine what it's like to be like the protagonists of the stories that around as a kid as well it's mm -hmm. like, your story is very different but i can understand it a little i can understand a little bit oh yeah if i went through this long sequence of events i would feel some of the ways that you feel that makes sense totally you were hurt by all these people and now you hate them that <laughs> makes sense if i hurt by those people in those ways i would probably hate them too yeah yes. like it's 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 such a relief to like i'm like i'm like getting a little emotional talking about this like it's mm. such a relief to like get to that level of understanding of another person and be like wow Mm -hmm. everything you do makes so much sense now <laughs> oh yeah. my god it's so nice <laughs> yeah it's very connecting it's yeah 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 as opposed to like you know you just kind of read a bunch of tweets and you're like these people are fucking crazy <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> look at all these crazy fuckers with their beliefs that aren't mine <laughs> yes fucking, how does this work and it's like well it turns out other people have different lives and it's one thing to say i mean saying that has very little impact but actually getting to just see it to just like hear another person's life story enough to tell they're like oh that's why you believe completely different things from me. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. It's crazy.
Yeah, I think fiction definitely can have that and can be a way to train that. But I feel like this makes sense of why circling is so powerful because like it's live, it's with real people that can really respond to you yeah. in real time. Yeah. And you can like see the impacts of what you say on them and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you like rinse, repeat those feedback loops fast enough, like that's way faster than fiction can be. Like I love fiction, fiction's mm -hmm. incredible, but like actually hearing someone respond or say something over and over and over again is like much, much faster and deeper. Yeah, it's crazy. Like one of the first, my first circling experience, at some point I started talking about how I felt about my parents. Mm. Uh, and I was basically just like, just describing like, yeah, I have like a really bad relationship with my parents. It's, mm. it's terrible. Like I don't, it, it's, it's just, I just explained much of ways which was really bad. And the person I was circling with was like, oh, mm. that makes me want to, vomit he was mm. like, that makes me want to like vomit in a volcano <laughs> <laughs> like that. and i was really touched by that yeah. reaction i was like that was the, like i had been friends with this guy for probably three years and that was the first time i was like oh he cares about me mm. <laughs> like mm. that was like the first time i really like felt that i was like oh mm. oh he like feels bad about on my behalf mm -hmm. that my relationship was like that's crazy that's yeah. so cool <laughs> That was really touching. That was the first time I was like, oh, there's really something to this. There's like something about this circling set. I'm like not getting it anywhere else. And like, I want it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whatever this is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that I, I, I can think of a million more questions for you, but is there anything else that you want to talk about or share uh, before we head out? Uh, Nothing that immediately comes to mind. I mean, I'm happy I, if you had more questions, I would love to keep answering questions. I mm. Yeah, I mean, just now was coming up like uh, um, what, I don't I feel in retrospect sort of like dissatisfied by the ways that circling was presented to me and the ways mm. that the containers were held. And like, yeah, uh, I wonder if you have any like, any any thoughts about that of like yeah it's really powerful it's extremely helpful but like things yeah. that make it safer or, or better that you any thoughts that you have about that yeah this is, this is a sort of a timely question because there was like a mold bug wrote a thing about circling recently i didn't mm. read it but i had the impression that it was bad mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and i did i was like i'm just gonna get mad if i read this so i didn't i just need to not read it but like uh if that's it so I have a lot. I have a lot to say about this. It's just take a moment to, to like collect sure. thoughts. So, like, uh, it's possible to fuck up circling really badly. Uh, if you circle with people who don't know what they're doing, it can go really poorly, and you will not get to experience like the what I consider to be like the real meat of the, of the thing. Um, and there are lots of ways it can go really badly. Um, like, I, I think I saw someone quote a bit from Moldbug's piece that was like oh, somebody was like saying that they felt this way and it felt kind of like fake and performative to me and everybody else was like, oh, it's so great that you feel this way. And I was like, not into it. And my reaction is like, if you feel this way during a circle, you speak up about it. That's, that's the next move. The move is you speak up about it. You say, I feel like this is all bullshit. I don't believe that any of you feel that way. Uh, and you know, and a good facilitator will incorporate that into a circle. That's what circles are for, is for that kind of moment. Uh, it's very like, a certain kind of person starts circling and they're like, you know, they get to like, you know, be vulnerable and see other people being vulnerable and like connect with people and like feel warm and fuzzy. And, and they start to think, this is sort of according to my perspective, they start to think that, that circling is about feeling good. It's about like building connection with people. I don't believe that. Uh, that's never been how I read circling. Um, for me, circling is about truth. Hmm. And like the, the thing that you're, for me, the truth for me, the thing that you're trying to do in a circle is finding out the truth about what is happening in mm. that circle. Like a way that people will say this is like, is that in circling you're trying to find out like what is it like to be all the people in the circle, experiencing mm. the circle, and that's that's not about connection. Sometimes the way that people are is that they are such that they should not be connecting. Mm. Sometimes people just don't get along, and they shouldn't get along, and it's like right and proper for them to not connect. And a circle should discover that fact eventually. Mm. 
And so should be like, ah, yes, these two people do not get along. They should not connect. It is right and proper that they should be far away from each other. Mm. That has to be allowed. That has to be in there. You like, if you try to twist circling in the direction of building connection, even when it's inappropriate, I think that's quite bad. Um, it will lead to things like, you know, like false cheer, like people pretending to agree more than they do. That stuff is terrible. I, some of the most powerful moments in circles come from when one person is just objects to everything that's happening. Just like, this is bullshit. I hate everything that's happening right now. And whether they're, whether they're right or not, that the thing that's happening is bad, like that's, that's good stuff. Like, oh yeah, that's really happening. You really do feel an objection to whatever's going, whatever you perceive is going on. So that's true. And like, that's sort of a foundation for like more truth seeking on the part of the entire group, ideally. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there are people who will set themselves up as circling facilitators who, in my opinion, don't understand this. And they will try to facilitate connection instead. And that's not what I think circles are for. Uh, it's a fine thing to do. It's like fun and it feels good to facilitate connection. There are better, much safer ways to do it than circles. Uh, there, are the, there are like authentic relating games where you get to like be a little bit vulnerable, but in a much tighter container. The, the games will be like, here is this specific kind of vulnerability that we're going to have fun with. And we're not going to have any other kind. <laughs> it's just going to be this little bit. We're going to like, you know, talk for a minute at a time about something or we're going to like ask each other questions or we're going to like play a little fun little touch game or something like, but that's it. That's like the container. And those are a lot safer. It's like a lot, you run a lot less of a risk of like treading over weird boundaries and stuff like that than with circling, which is just so open-ended and so confusing to mm. navigate. Um, mm. If you haven't been introduced, like I, I feel like I was lucky to be introduced by, uh, so I, I, I was like, mostly introduced by a guy named Pete Showed, who used to be involved in the Austin authentic learning community and then moved to Bay to hang out with the rationalists for a while. And I don't know where he is now, but he's great. He's really fun. He's, he's really got it, I, according to me. Mm. And <laughs> probably there are people who disagree with that. Or, or at least whatever he's doing, I like it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I like the way he does it. And, um, and yeah, if you, if you like go to a random circling event, just like i don't know i've heard i've heard some unfortunate stories of people who are just like like rationalists for example who will just like try to spontaneously start circles with other rationalists and everyone's just like kind of ha kind of has a bad time and like concludes that that's what circling is and mm. they're like oh circling sucks mm. i i circled once and it was terrible that wasn't that wasn't real <laughs> you know, like, obviously everyone is going to be very uh, defensive of their thing and they're like well that wasn't the real thing but really that wasn't the real thing you did not experience the real thing you were led by a bunch of amateurs. Rationalists are also often very bad at circling. Like I, mm. there was a whole, it's just a very funny um, period. I don't know if it's still happening where like the circling communities and the rationalists were trying to like dialogue and do stuff together. And what the circling people kept finding is that if there were too many rationalists in a circle, it would go very poorly. Mm -hmm, <laughs> and mm -hmm. they did not know what to do about it. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. is so funny to me, but it's also terrible. Um, and I eventually gave up on circling with rationalists. I last tried, I think, in 2018 or 2019. I tried to lead a circle at an alumni reunion with all rationalists, and it just went very poorly. Mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to do about it, and I just gave up. I was like, it's too hard. There are mm -hmm. too many. You have to, like, this is, this is, this is sort of a, a maybe provocative way of saying it, but there's just too many layers of defenses to get through, and it's mm -hmm. just not. <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to have other people in the circle who can like demonstrate how to actually do it and how to like actually kind of like open up and be actually kind of vulnerable mm. and they need to be able to see that vibe for everyone else and if there's too many people like the rationalists who are just like very very closed off very tightly protected very tight like you know like uh -huh. you know very yeah. tightly defensive that's just not going to happen everyone's just going to stay that way mm -hmm. like, I feel like feeling in a circle that other people are doing that makes you want to do that. So, well, this isn't, this isn't safe. This is, this is a danger zone where people are mm -hmm. tense. It's, it's just, I gave up. Mm -hmm. like, it's not worth it to try to figure out how to do this. And the, the two things I'm hearing, one are like, if you're new to it, doing it with a sufficient quantity of people that actually know what they're doing and are experienced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then second, uh, you, prefer that the goal or orientation be truth seeking rather than connection. Yeah. 
And it's tricky because people will say the circling doesn't have a goal or something or whatever. Mm. And that's like very confusing. Mm. I don't think, I don't know if that's a good way to introduce mm. circling. Like I, there is, there's like a, one of the better ways I've heard people try to describe circling and all, okay. There's also an additional difficulty, which is that there are many different schools of circling. There are like yes. at least three that I'm aware of and they have, they uh, actually have pretty different ideas about what to do. And so maybe there should just be different words for whatever it is that they're doing. Um, but like, there is a there is a kind of a, one of the better ways I've heard a particular kind of circling described is as a relational meditation, mm. like sort of doing the kinds of things people would do in meditation, but in a group. And because we're in a group, it requires a lot more communication mm -hmm. than like when you're solo, uh, because you have to like you know, the information about what's happening has to pass somehow. Um, but I was going to say about relational meditation. I was going to say something. I lost track of it slightly. Could you repeat the question a bit? That might help me job. Oh, I was just sort of summarizing what I thought your uh, perspective was, was that right. it's like about truth seeking rather yeah. than connection. Right, thank you. So in, medit you might you, in meditation, you might have an idea of what the goal of meditation is. Someone mm. might tell you an idea of what the goal of meditation is. And ideally, it seems to me, proper meditative practice should sort of uh, go beyond any particular statement about what the goal of meditation is. Like. Mm. There's sort of like too much, the thing that's happening there is kind of like too real to be mm. captured by any particular words about it. And circling mm. is a bit like that in that like, insofar as there's like a true goal of circling, it's sort of like too, too ineffable or nebulous or something to be captured by words. And so perhaps one should say as little about it as possible. So even truth seeking is kind of an impoverished way to describe it from that yeah, perspective. Yeah, because truth is like, you know, a rationalist hears truth and they are like, oh, truth like math is no, not truth like math. Truth, mm. like I feel betrayed, I feel abandoned, like emotional truth, rough mm. things that are more like, more like, more like, uh, like living truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, you know, this is, I just don't have very good words for this, like mm -hmm. spiritual truth, you know, not mm -hmm. even just that. All of those words are kind of misleading. <laughs> it's just very frustrating. Um, and so one, one has to kind of like the, the thing, the meditation or the circling has to kind of change your understanding of what the goal of the practice is. And this is why it's so important to be to be introduced by people who know what they're doing because they mm -hmm. can embody it mm -hmm. instead of having to explain it to you. They can just do it. Then you can look at what they're doing and experience what they're doing. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. that's what they're doing. Um, yeah, it's like a transmission. Yeah, like a transmission. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably more valuable than any one circle that I had is just seeing how people do it. Like I can definitely think of circles that were like quite significant for me and were meaningful, but like mm -hmm. consistently having the skills that I saw other people demonstrate has been far more useful to me yeah. in the long run, I'd say. Yeah. 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 Sure. Hmm. Um, hmm. Um, another question to ask is like, what, you know, we talked about meta therapy and self therapy stuff, and mm -hmm. like, where would you, in the absence of your book on it, uh, uh, where would you suggest someone start with that stuff if they're pretty new to it? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have a recommendation. Um, mm -hmm. I think, insofar as as, as a person listening to this feels like they're in this category of like, oh yeah, I like run around and collecting their techniques and stuff. Like, I guess just keep doing that. I think it's good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, we're like, and, but if you feel an inclination towards some kind of systematizing, it's like, what if this could all be made a little bit more systematic? What if there could be a little bit more of like a single underlying framework? Then mm -hmm. like, I also think that's good. Like, mm -hmm. please, please keep following that inclination and see. Whoop, see where you end up I think it'll be cool mm. and if you end up in a place very different from where i end up that's also cool because mm -hmm. well, then you know we can learn some stuff from each other mm. what know, are i don't really have a have a reference maybe mark's protocol doc is the best reference mm. that i can point people to that, mm. that is again at meditation book dot page mm -hmm. but it's like very the scope of it is like even bigger than the scope of metatherapy because it incorporates mm -hmm. all sorts of other meditation-y, like it, it, the scope is just enormous. And so I, I think that document is, is like kind of intimidating and overwhelming. Uh, mm -hmm. or can. You alluded to this earlier, but in the, in the document, there's sort of a list of different 
like sort of core concepts that have been fundamental to how you model these things. And uh, could you kind of, um, yeah, some some of them, it might even, you know, I'll just pull up the list here because yeah, uh, there's there's several of them that I'd want to ask you about. So uh, just pull this out one second. There's there the, we go. Uh, there's the outline. Oh, the outline's so nice. I love the Google Docs outline. Yeah, that's a good outline. Uh, let's see. Okay, right from the start, concept. You say concept buffet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how would you describe? Again, plain English here. I'm an intelligent person that's not a rationalist or mathematical or STEM-minded, yeah. uh, and just assume the audience is as well. Yeah. Uh, some people will be rationalists or STEM-minded, but we can assume mm -hmm. I am not. Uh, mm -hmm. How would you describe in your own language what global wayfinding is? Yeah, so... I don't think I have anything super pithy to say, so I'm just going to start talking. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, for me, there was a time in seventh grade actually where i uh i was emergency expelled for 10 <laughs> days now we don't need to get into the details but i i fucked up and it was a very eye-opening experience for me i was like whoa wait a second what if the stuff that i want to do isn't always good <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know there was there was like some way in which i became conscious for the first time there mm -hmm. like some kind of aspect of consciousness like some kind of reflective capability that i like didn't really have or wasn't really exercising up until that point uh, then i started exercising so you know once you once you start reflecting on your own actions you're like what if i wouldn't what if i shouldn't what if some of the stuff i did was bad and i should do different stuff then you need some kind of way to figure out what to do you hmm. need like some kind of some kind of compass to navigate by and from well in my understanding of global wayfinding is that it refers to the process of both following such a compass and also deciding what compass to follow, which is, which gets very twisty because how do you decide what compass to follow? You can't do anything other than using the compasses you already have. Mm. So this is kind of like, this is like very twisty recursive nature to it where like deciding what to follow involves deciding how to decide what to follow. Mm. But for example, you might, you might be like, oh, I should, maybe I should, you know, you start reflecting on your own behavior and it's like, oh, maybe I should do things that are, morally good maybe i should learn what moral goodness is maybe i should go take read some philosophy and like adopt a moral philosophy and then try to follow that philosophy so that's an example of a kind of global wayfinding you could do uh for me personally another thing i tried was i tried listening to my feelings mm. hey friends uh unfortunately at this point chow Chu's internet was cutting out so conversation ends there but i enjoyed it and hope you did too and maybe we'll have qca back on at some point